Desert and the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening and or good morning wherever you may be across this great land of ours. From the Tahitian and Hawaiian Islands in the west, nestled in the warm trade winds of the Pacific, eastward to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, with their own soft winds, south into South America, north all the way to the pole, and worldwide on the Internet. And by the way, hello to my friends down at the Antarctic, at McMurdo. This is Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell, and it's great to be here tonight. We are going to talk tonight about one of my favorite topics in the world. Maybe my favorite, actually. Time travel. In the first hour, I'm going to talk to time travelers. You. Those of you out there who claim to be time travelers. Now, in the second hour, we're going to have a... Actually, a very serious guest on time travel, David Anderson, Dr. Uh, David Anderson, Ph.D., is a former United States Air Force officer, flight test engineer, and scientist who developed a passion for space-time study while conducting research at the prestigious Air Force Flight Test Center. Now, listen to this. For the last 20 years, he has been formulating and developing his breakthrough concepts in space-time physics and the study of time. His work led to the development of what uh, today is called the Time Warped Field Theory. His research holds the first promise for the development and application of practical time control technology. In 1995, Dr. Anderson founded the Time Travel Research Center Today, the world's most advanced research laboratory dedicated exclusively to the study and development of time control technology and its application. His company also sponsors an organization called the Time Travel Research Association, which networks time travel inf information and interests from more than 80 countries around the world. Now, as you know, uh, many of our nation's top Theoretical physicists uh, insist that with a proper amount of energy, time travel is definitely going to be possible. Therefore, if time travel is going to be possible, if that is a, an accurate scenario, then one might reasonably ask, well, then where are the time travelers? They ought to be here, right? They ought to be here. And I suspect... They are here. Now, I'm not saying that when I begin picking up lines here in a few minutes, a requesting to talk to any of you who claim to be time travelers, I'm not saying that these people are real, and I'm not saying they're not. That's for you to judge. All I'm saying is that it is reasonable to assume that if time travel will eventually be a reality, then there should be time travelers here now. There really should. But this hour, what I want to do is talk to people, you out there, who claim to be travelers in time. Believe me, it's interesting. Strange, but interesting. So if you're a... A time traveler, call me. That's all we're going to take calls from this hour. People who claim to have arrived here, be here now, through time, through whatever method. Huh. Coming right up. Time travelers only. If you have traveled in time, or you are presently a traveler to this time, then we want to hear from you. Otherwise, the phone lines are closed, but for that group, they are certainly open. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Yes. Art? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, Connor in Strongsville, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. So how's Ohio this morning? It's uh, doing very nice. Very nice. Yes. Good. I'm listening on WTAM. Big one, yes. Yes. Um, I was calling in to say, I give you some mad props for listening to some of these people. You're what? Giving you, uh, 
some uh, very good praise listening to some of these people. They're dealing with them very well. And I also proposed a question asking, uh, you know, I was wondering if all these people are calling from time traveling. You seem to be a big uh, fan of time travel, so why haven't you called yourself back? You know, that's a pretty good question. Um, I suppose my answer would be a little flip. I, I, I'd probably say, looking at the way my lines ring, I probably couldn't get through. <laughs> I'm oh, serious. Yeah. 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 I really am serious. I, although I can imagine that if I were, you can bet that if I traveled in time, mm -hmm. back within, say, the years that I've been on the air, or forward to whatever years I have left to be on the air, mm -hmm. I sure as hell would want to call my show. <laughs> Except, uh, I suppose that people would, they'd really doubt me, wouldn't they? Yeah. I mean, I'm waiting, you know, and maybe hear, like, someone I know, or imagine hearing yourself on the radio, you know, 12 years in the future, or whenever someone's calling you, you know, a young kid or something, hearing yourself on the radio. Yeah. That'd be kind of weird. It would. Yeah. Now I have old tapes of myself when I was a virtual youngster on the radio, because I've been on the radio all my life. Yeah. That's kind of like time travel. <laughs> really? Wow. wow. Makes me sick to listen to myself back then. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just trying to pose a question. And can I say something to some people here in Strongsville? The Strongsville? Yeah, outside. It's my where I live. Well, if if it's a general sort of thing. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, vote Connor for senior class president. Since I'm running, and so I just want to say that to anyone who's listening. You called me up. To give a, pl you're running for class president. No, I call senior class president, or no, somebody else is. No, that's me. That's you. Yeah. So I you're called you up to propose the time. You're travel giving plug. yourself a plug for senior class president on a national radio program. Yeah. I, 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 I saw a movie. Did you see that movie about the girl who was running for? Uh, I think it was senior class president. Matter of fact, there was a whole movie about it. They were sabotaging each other, and oh, it was vicious. No, I don't think I saw that one. Yeah, well, I, I can't think of the name of it offhand. Somebody will come up with it. Okay. Well, you, um, you should watch it. it. It'll help you with tactics. <laughs> well, what, are you, what are you promising? What's your platform? My platform? Nope. Um, I'm trying to give back to the senior class of Strongzo. Less, less homework? Uh... Um, you know, give back to the students. You know, there's some things that maybe they're not happy with at the school. It was called Election, by the way. The movie was simply called Election, so you're, you're going to want to see that as soon as you can. Oh, wow. That's awesome, to write it. Anyway, you get, you're going to give back what? what? Whatever the students need to talk to me about. I mean, if they need to talk to me about something, you know, do I'll you, give do back. Do you have I, any, as senior, if you, if, you, if you are elected, do you have power to help them? Um, Some power. I mean, that's another thing I want to work on. I want to make the student government at Strunzel High School more powerful. So, because... Mm -hmm. It's it's a uh, it's rough tumble to deal with, but I'm running and staying strong in the election, so it should be a pretty good race. What and, makes you want to get involved in politics? I mean, that really is what it is. It's politics, you know. Well, I, the main reason I want to get involved in politics is because I uh, basically care for people in my school. That's not just a crap answer. I mean, yeah, but really... it sounds like a crap answer. You you've got to come up with a new way to say it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Clinton had what? I feel your pain. I, I, I don't, I don't even want to come up with a slogan. I mean, I just have, I have lots of friends and I care for them. You gotta have slogans. Well, I have a couple slogans I put as jokes on campaign signs. Like, like what? Don't like believe what? all the rumors. Vote for Connor. Hey, that's good. Uh, that's that's good. The pictures weren't of me. Vote for Connor. <laughs> that, that's that's a pretty good one. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, and be sure and see the movie Election. You are on the air. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. 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 We're here. Uh, yes. My name is Robert, and uh, I am not quite a time traveler. I'm from a little bit different dimension than yours. Uh, well, that's and okay. And okay. I, I listen. I think that may be virtually the same thing. You claim to be from another dimension. Uh, yes, Senator. I I'm not a senator. Oh, oh, okay. I'm I, sorry. A little okay. slip there. You haven't you haven't okay. testified in front of a group lately, have you? No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, uh, I don't actually... know. <laughs> There's no other way somebody would say yes, Senator. Uh, well, actually, the uh, one of the, the my original dimension I'm from. You are a senator of Arizona. Well, I'll be dead. So, of, of Arizona? 
Yes, uh, basically... Senator Art Bell. Arizona uh, Senator Art Bell. Boy, that has a ring to it. Yes, it, uh, yes, it does. <laughs> Definitely does. Uh, basically, what happened in my dimension, uh, the South won the Civil War. The, and South, the from, South won the Civil War? Yes, at the uh, first battle of Bull Run, basically, that's where the Civil War ended. And I am from, in an awful dimension, the Confederate <laughs> States of America. Wow! Uh, now... Were they, did they, if the South won the Civil War, they, all states would be Confederate, wouldn't they? Well, no. Actually, the original Mason-Dixon line holds. There is the United States of America, which runs at the Pennsylvania-Maryland border, roughly. Uh, which is, well, that's where it is Pennsylvania, now. Pennsylvania-Maryland border, and also up into Canada. Uh, in oh, the into Confederate Canada, states. Really? Yes. Uh, shortly after that, basically, Lincoln resigned. I uh, was um, loved watching. Your Civil War, a couple of years ago, you had the PBS special, and it was a big hit in our dimension because it was something that, you know, it didn't, we never thought that had been possible. But, uh. So, it, yes. so it, that special appeared in your dimension as well? Well, it didn't appear in my dimension. We just basically brought it back. We've been able to. What, what about history between, uh, the ending of the Civil War, which you say was different, and now, yeah. it, it must be indeed in your dimension entirely it's, different. It's entirely different. Basically what happened is, is the United States went ahead and invaded Canada. The Confederate States of America have basically went all the way to your Panama, which is basically Mexico all the way to Central America are just Confederate States to us. They're just another flag on our stars and bars. So really, in that dimension, we physically possess part, how much of Canada? It's all of Canada. All, all right. I've really wanted Canada for a long time, and and well, so and so. Art, if you ever come over, uh, if, if I ever meet you, I'll have to take you uh, to where I live. And can you do that? Is that possible? Yes, that is possible. Uh, basically, what about the, what about this terrible conundrum of not being able to meet yourself? Though? I mean, what if I came with you? And met Senator Bell. Wouldn't I possibly blink out? No, no. You're just a different person from him. You're there's. You're not uh, sort of difficult to explain. I don't know. I'm. My job basically is pretty much to go out. I'm retired. Um, my I, job I, is to go I, out. I can hear the Southern accent in you. No question yes. about it. Yes, but uh, no. My, I'm basically retired. Uh, my job was to go out to different dimensions and sort of scout them out and see. You uh, sound basically how they different. You how, sound a little a, a little young to be retired. Uh, I've of course, had of course who am I to talk? I've had I've had uh, rejuvenation. So rejuvenation. Uh, yes. Another advantage in in by the way, how should we consider this dimension? As how, is there a way to phrase where you say you are from? Is it a fourth dimension, uh, a fifth dimension? It's, uh, basically, we've explored right now about 50 different offshoots of the planet Earth. Holy smokes. You mean different dimensional different, ren renderings different what of, if. of Earth? Uh, basically, from our dimension, how time is split differently. There's a lot of big, of course, there's a couple of splits uh, where the United States lost the Cold War. We, of course, there's... There's several where we uh, lost the Civil War. Uh, there's one where basically uh, Nazi Germany won. Nazi Germany won World War Two. World War Two. Boy, what a hellish place that must be. Yes, it is. It's it's extremely bad. We don't. We basically. Well, I've talked to some of the people. They popped in and they saw swastikas in Richmond and they left. Didn't want them. That's about Holy all. Holy Um now, our theoretical physicists are presently in this dimension beginning to realize there are other dimensions. Um, some of our best are saying that, but they're speculating 10, some more, and you're saying as many as 50. Uh, 50 that we've explored. There are a lot more. We, and we didn't find, basically, we found uh, part of this technology in Europa, which is... Uh, has an intelligent race. I don't know if it has it here. We haven't really 
got to the point where we could explore. We're very curious about Europa in this dimension, thinking it might have some form of life, but probably fairly primitive. Well, this is, I, I don't know quite how to explain it. This dimension, th this dimension is probably, it's fairly dangerous to go to. The one we're in, uh, we're, you're talking about yes. the one? Yes, the, the one that we're in currently, Senator, yes. <laughs> Stop with the senator stuff already. Okay. All right. I'm not a senator in this dimension. Okay. And I don't much have respect for a lot of them either. Okay. Well, then I apologize. Sir. So, in fact, it worries me to even think that I might be one in another. Okay. But Arizona would be a good state. I was. It's be. it's a very nice state. Uh -oh. it, anyway, this is a, a no kidding on this dangerous dimension stuff. I mean, I'm reading. You know, I'm reading this environmental news. And the ozone layer is getting gigantic to the point where they say it's going to be affecting us up north here the way Australia is affected. Uh, the ocean is warming. The storms are getting worse. Uh, things are going to hell in a handbasket, really. Well, we're, we're concerned about that. And we're also concerned about, uh, I guess, how conspiratorial the, the United States government is. Oh, we are so conspiratorial. It is, Even it is my true. listeners, uh, believe me, my listeners are so conspiratorial. Listen, yes, I, I, I am. I am too. I am too. Now that I think about it, but uh, what? Why are you here? Uh, basically, like I said, I'm here to uh, basically to scout out different areas to determine whether or not to actually present ourselves to governments. Uh, that's one of the things I do. Do you think that's it's, a good idea, or do you think no, that's a danger? No, not such a no, good it's, idea. It's a, it's a very dangerous idea. You're weak uh, to basically say that I'm from the Confederate States of America. Mm -hmm. That's going to get you in trouble all, right away. It's going to get me in trouble. We did settle the slavery issue when Robert E. Lee was president. So you're saying right. then that the Confederate States did not maintain slavery? Uh, no. It, perhaps it a longer period of time, but not. It uh, it basically uh, it went away. He had uh, what was called a Lafouche plan, which uh, slaves were able to buy their freedom, and they had a choice of going back to uh, Liberia, are staying here, and if they stayed here, they had to hmm. basically move out of the state that they were originally enslaved in. And uh, at that time, we were basically uh, we were annexing Mexico, and there was a lot of land down there. So, so boy, in your dimension, we have a a, we have a lot more land. I mean, we we swallowed Canada in one quick bite, and then a lot of Mexico as well, huh? Well, the Confederate States took Mexico. Uh, we we took Mexico and then uh, what what you call the United States took Canada. Yes, sir. So you you all were rebels with a real cause. Uh, yes, we were. Uh, I guess now a bunch of land you bunch of land grabbers is what you are. Well, we're, that was that but, was quite a while ago. But. I know that's what they say here too. So, um, what is the future for this dimension? Is it a rosy one or? I don't know. I'm um, kind of a poopy one. I guess the thing that we're most surprised about, uh, since we went to a lot of dimensions with this level of technology, is the lack of space travel that uh, that you have done. I'm, I've I've seen other, I guess, uh, I've seen other areas with the same tech level or the the same technology that you have, and they have already put, they already have a a colony on the moon. They've already landed people at Mars. They're towing asteroids. And Listen orbits from here, I, I, I'm pressed by the clock. I've got to take a break. Do you, do you want to hold on? You're really an interesting person. Uh, yes, I can hold on for just a little bit longer. Just a little longer? Uh, probably maybe ten more minutes. I really don't. Uh, it's conspiracy. Uh, conspiracy. <laughs> I really don't like this. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Give me ten minutes. I'll be happy okay. with that. All right. Stand by. In this dimension. I'm Art Bell and this is Coast to Coast AM. Don't touch that dial. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nine. You know, at the top of the hour, we have a PhD type professor coming on to talk about time travel. Real time travel. It's such a romantic notion for me. How about you? imagine another time maybe another dimension another world another way things worked out in time Re really really interesting stuff anyway we're going to get back to our dimensional traveler in a moment
Thank you for waiting, caller. Is there a big... I mean, isn't dimensional travel a, tra a type of time travel? Uh, not really. As far as our scientists can tell, no, not really. What happens is, I guess there are... Time is same. Uh, when I go back to my dimension, it's it's the same time as it is here. Ah, so, so time, time is linear in each yes. different dimension. Yes, as far as we know. Uh, I guess one thing... So that, then, that means Art Bell, the talk show host, and Art Bell, the senator, do they live to be different ages? Um, uh, yes. Yes, they can. I mean, I've, I know of you, at least in one other dimension, where uh, you uh, host, a, you're not going to believe this, you host a talk show on the moon. You uh, are basically uh, broadcast uh, uh, from the moon. From the moon. Uh, from the moon. Uh, basically, I can, you know, I would entertain... Uh, that option, if it were given to me. Uh, listen, there's somebody who would like to ask you a quick question. Um, on my international line, uh, where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Larry. I'm calling from Sudbury, Ontario, 300 Sudbury. miles north of Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, actually, territory that isn't even actually Canada. That's right. To my well, present. There is, uh, there is an Ontario. It's just another flag in the United States. <laughs> All right. Uh, call, it's Robert, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Sure. What are the cars like there? Are there Chevys, Ford? Do they drive differently? Same kind of transmissions? Some of the uh, names of the cars? Really good questions, yeah. Uh, basically, we have uh, we have what's called in uh, in Atlanta, which is our equivalent of Detroit, is uh, what's called Trafalgar uh, Ironworks, and they have uh, a variety of different uh, of different models and makes. So, in other words, that is your Detroit. Yeah. Atlanta is basically our Detroit. Uh, basically, I guess what would be called uh, a lot of. Uh, I'm going to be polite here. I guess a lot of. We all prefer to call Negroes blacks, right? I want to make sure that I don't offend anybody. But blacks. Blacks in this, into, in this time, in this uh, yes dimension, would be proper. Right okay, now. would be blacks. Okay, yes. uh, blacks moved up into I guess the Iowa area, and there's a town, very large town there, called New Jerusalem. Which is the New Jerusalem in Iowa? The United States. Now, he asked about cars. Can you describe any automobiles? Uh, pretty much they would be the same. Ours mostly run on electric. We don't have Figures. a lot of diesel. Figures. Uh, we in the South prefer a big muscle car. How can you have a muscle electric car? I guess you could if you had enough electricity. Do you have gasoline at all? Yeah. Do you? What? Hello? We we lost him. We lost him. He's uh -oh. gone. He's gone. We lost him. He's out he, of gas. He said, well, he said hey, out of gas. <laughs> he <laughs> said, well, he said he only had 10 minutes, and I guess yeah, his, that's true. his 10 minutes are up. But I love questions like that, Art. Well, I uh, so Detroit is virtually in Atlanta, huh? Yeah. Interesting. I, I also wanted to ask him about trains and aircraft. How would you guys feel being consolidated as, as U.S.? never having been well if it was the natural evolution of history i mean it would be fine you know what i mean as long as you don't force the issue i mean if it if that's the way that it happened well that's the way it had happened that's right we're, we're at the same time canada and the united states are both very different so you wouldn't have that medical very system. much the same you wouldn't have that medical system up there you wouldn't have but but you would have <laughs> well that, that medical system is on the shaky legs right now there's yeah, a lot I've, of controversy I've, I've, I've heard that yeah. yeah all right well listen thank you very much Thank you. And, uh, you take care. Uh, caller from Canada. Well, in this dimension. Uh, first time caller line, you are on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Art, how are you? I'm quite well. How about yourself? Well, I'm doing quite well, thank you. Listen, it's been a long time. I've been listening to you for years. For years now, huh? Yeah, yes, I have. Are you a time traveler? Well, yes. Yeah, something happened to me because of your show. What? Well, first of all, it goes back to 1995. Uh, I'm located up here uh, on the Russian River in Santa Rosa, on KSRO uh, country, and we were flooded. Our house was like uh, basically cut in half. I was forced then to work uh, uh, many days in a row. I'm a truck driver. I've, I've listened to you for years yes. over the night, like like you have mentioned. Yes, yes. The time travel part. Well, the time travel part goes like this. I was working so many days that I caught one of your shows and I listened to to, uh, to uh, Malachi Martin yes. and uh, he told me and or uh, to the most of your audience 
you know, how to pray, how to accept acceptance. And something happened, man. What? I'm tired. I've gone like, you know, I'm running illegal. I'm going like 23, 24 days in a row. I hear a lot of truckers do that. You know? Yeah, 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 but, you know. And so you had an epiphany on the road somewhere. No, no man. No, no? Something happened, and, and suddenly I got touched. I felt like I got hit by like a little golden wand or whatever that, that, it hit me on the top of my head when right. Sure, that you just like didn't bang your head on as you were getting out of the truck or something. No, no, I mean I made sure that that's not what happened. If anything, it woke me up <clears throat> to a lot more than what I, I knew in the past, and I started to see into the future. Hmm. And what I started to see into the future was this. I, I didn't see so much of the doom and gloom. What I started to see was was the things that the the natural changes. We're going through a tremendous rate of change right now, and it includes all of us. But but most importantly, what I saw in, in a flash, in, in an instance, I is know, one. What, what I saw, what I saw was a, a, a better place to be. In, in other how, words, how far ahead is that? Because right now the signs. I mean, the canaries are dropping like flies here. Yeah, I realize the canaries are dropping like flies. I realize that we've got global warming and there's yeah. chunks of ice, like, you know, melting and breaking Right, so, so so then when does it get better? The better part is around the corner, and I would say maybe in 10 years. Uh, what, what, I just, what I saw was something that flashed upon So you me. didn't actually, then, you, you didn't really travel in time. You, you, I saw, you saw ahead in time is what I you did. Saw, I'm not exactly sure how you would say that. I'm not, all I know is that something touched me. Were you actually, okay, let's put it this way. Were you actually, seemingly, actually there? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear that... Uh, no, well, I, well, no, hold on a second. I know what you're going to say, Art. I know what you're going to say. What? Hold on, man. Uh, no, I mean, this is what this is something that, that happened... In an instant. Well, what about in the moment? No, I understand that. I, but, but look, there would be critics who would say, you said you were driving illegal, you were doing a million hours, you shouldn't have done it, you had a brain spasm. No, it wasn't a brain spasm. No. Uh, a okay. trucker's brain spasm. What? How do you know? Because that would be the criticism. I mean, especially with what you said. Well, I'll tell you exactly how I know. First of all, uh, it was a warm feeling, and it was a feeling of acceptance, and it kind of glowed the whole cab of inside my truck after so many years of not really uh, believing, no. so to speak, being a hard, kind of tough guy, and all of a sudden realizing and seeing something that was so cool. I said, you know what? There is something else out there, and it's powerful, and you know what? I got a, a, an immediate calm about me, and for a moment, in a blink of an eye, in a blink of your eye, what I saw what was the state of the future. And, and what, this I rose, what you saw was a rosy future. All right, I've got it. So uh, trucking into the future. I guess we'll call that. I don't know. A trucker. I can't rule out the possibility that he whacked his head as he got out of the truck or that uh, his cab warmed up when he sort of fell off the cliff mentally. After driving for so many hours, you've got to allow that at least as a possibility. Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Yeah, hi, Art. Hello. I've been doing some uh, dimensional traveling. Yourself, huh? Yeah. So again, well, okay, then let me ask you like I did the first caller, yeah. who apparently uh, had a prepaid phone card that ran out. Yes, sir. Is, is, it, is time linear in every dimension, as yeah. he suggested? Yeah. It is. And from what what is the dimension like that you are from? It's very similar, and that's one that's one problem that they had there was when I was sent. They gave me this special card were, that I was supposed to when I come back. You were I sent, supposed, huh? You were sent. Yeah, that when I was supposed to come back, I was supposed to check it to make sure I was in the right dimension. Yes, and it didn't match. Oh, brother. So, in other words, you're saying you were tossed here by mistake. Well, we found out that there are so many multiple dimensions that it's almost impossible to get back to your own. You can get back to a similar one. But getting back to precisely where you were is almost not possible, so it's like you're stuck here then. Very difficult. 
Well, if this one is kind of like the one you came from, or with very few, what are the differences? Can you describe any differences? Uh, Do they have dogs there? Yeah. Yeah. Houses? Yeah. Detroit? Cars? Right. The, the main Ozone depletion, being... ocean warming, all the problems we've got? Basically, yes. Yeah. Any difference at all? Well, there'd be differences like, okay, like that one guy, you know, you'd, you'd be like the senator or, you know, different senators, different congressmen at different times, you know, little things. But basically, even even if we lost, lost the First World War, in some dimensions, it'd end up almost the same. There's different points of history that just absolutely have to happen. Well, what about Canada and Mexico? And, they, you know, I take it. There is a Canada, there is a Mexico. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, there was one that I went to where um, Martin Luther King didn't exist. Malcolm oh. X didn't. These would be radical. Very, very different. Very different then. Right. So the civil rights movement didn't happen. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Then what would the state of blacks be in your dimension versus this one? Well, in that one, they were still segregated out, you know, whites-only areas and malls, you know. Um, well, that stinks. So you're in a, really, um, you should count your lucky stars that you're in a better place. Right. Huh. Yeah, it, 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 that, that dimension was bad. Are you bummed out that you're stuck here? No. No, 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 no. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's okay. Do you frequently tell people what you're telling me now? Nope. And it, no. No? Nope. That's probably a good idea. Right. They wouldn't, so a lot of them wouldn't take it real well. Not really. Well, listen, I certainly appreciate your calling me. Oh, okay. And uh, you have a good night, sir. West of the Rockies, uh, wait a minute here. Let me do this again. Oh, boy. West of the Rockies, are you there? I'm here. Good, good, good. You're on the air. Yes. Uh, this is Bob in California. Hello, Bob. Um, I met myself when I was eight years old. I met myself. <laughs> now you see, I've heard you can't do that, but you're saying you can. I met myself from the future. It was really, really weird. When I was eight years old in grammar school, I'd, uh, be, I'd like play alone uh, during the uh, uh, recess period. Right. Like behind a tree with my little army men and my cars. Oh, yes, I played with army men. <laughs> and uh, this guy shows up, and he's like dressed all in white. Uh, it was almost like a uniform, and he had gray hair, almost white. Yes. And uh, I kind of recognized him at the uh, after the conversation, and uh, it, and I I think it was me. <laughs> but he asked me a lot of questions. Yeah, he, he knew everything. Oh, that's about really intriguing. So, in other words, your older self from the future or a future came and met you. Right. How did you recognize yourself? How did you know it was you? Good question. I, I think I recognized my teeth because I've got these very distinct bicuspid teeth that stick out, and uh, I never had orthodontics. And I guess I, I, I had my permanent teeth by that age. A sort, a sort of a Bugs Bunnyism. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. But, but, but very identifiable. It's yeah, it's like a fingerprint. And uh, I recognized my teeth. And later, I also recognized the mole that I Other didn't... than your toothiness, how did you look? I mean, <laughs> were you fairly... Were you aging um, reasonably? Well, at eight years old, you're not all that discriminating, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, critiquing an adult. But uh, uh, I, I, I was clean. I had great white clothing, and uh, I had gray or white hair. And I, I just asked myself a lot of questions uh, about my brother and my parents. And, uh, and and things like that. And, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's it's kind of like I went back in time to psychoanalyze myself. Uh, now you're confusing me. Well, see, it's like sometime in the future when I'm 60 or 70 years old, I, I somehow... Obviously, you will go back, right? I, I, yeah, I get access to a time machine or some kind of astral projection or something. And, and I, you, I, whatever it is, you will go back and meet yourself at six years of age or whatever. Well, I think it was closer to eight or nine. Eight, eight or nine, yeah. whatever. And um, uh, uh, yeah, I've got it. I wow. wish I could tell you some information. I wish I had given me a few hints of like, like uh, things that happen in the future that I could tell your audience. But, but most of the questions that you had, I mean, obviously, I understand they'd be personal. Yeah, yeah I think I, I just went back there to kind of get a glimpse at myself when I was a child. Um, 
Which end of it do you really remember, or do you remember both ends? Do you remember? No, I, I only remember what occurred, you know, when I was eight. You know, I, I, I'm just 36 right now. Right. So I guess sometime in the future when I have white hair, I, I've got a little bit of gray already. Huh. I've got this mole that showed up under my eye that this, that this guy had. Same mole, huh? Yeah, well, yeah, at eight I didn't have it, but I, I've got it about five years ago. And well, we're getting there. I mean, this is nearly enough to convict you if it was a crime. <laughs> a mole and a toothiness and other general characteristics that you could see where you must have been really weird. Well, I, I, it didn't really dawn on me until this mole sort of started growing on, uh, on my cheek, and then uh, I, I sort of thought back to that memory, and, and as my face kind of grew. You know, think of yourself when you were eight. If you were to meet yourself today, would you recognize yourself? Um, what an interesting question. Um, I was an annoying little SOB. I'd, I'd probably recognize myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I guess, but I'm not, now that I think about it, I'm not really sure. So, but, but you obviously did, and, uh, what a weird thing it must have been. I thought I just should share it uh, with you, and maybe you can ask. And, and how weird it must be to think that you are going to do it. I mean, this is something that lies in your fairly immediate future. No, no, no. I, I, I have white hair in the in the, in the person I met, so I, I think it's probably thirty years. Yeah, from... well, thirty years, but there's, thirty years are cosmically is a you know, yeah. it's a blink in time. There's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. All right. Well, listen. Thank you very, very much for calling. Okay. I've got a scoop. We are going to talk about time tonight, as we already have been, but now with an expert. I'm Art Bell, and from the high desert, this is Coast to Coast AM. A kingdom of nine. All right. It's my favorite subject uh, of them all, frankly. It's time travel. And we've got somebody who's doing the real research, the hardware research. He's amazing. He's Dr. David Anderson. I had him on shortly before I left last April. And uh, I think you're going to want to hear what he has to say. And we'll catch up on what he's done. All of that uh, immediately ahead. But rest assured, uh, my friend, that that first hour is going to be repeated as soon as we get into repeat at the end of the program. Oh, one more thing. I've had enough fun with you, I guess, on the webcam. <laughs> that uh, photograph on the webcam site uh, where you would normally see me live. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 15 minutes to look at it on the website, and then I'll turn on the webcam again. But I thought I'd just leave it up there for shock value. Some listener sent it after the program. I called Keith said, hey, why don't we put it up there where the webcam would normally be? And he said, yeah, that would be fun. So if you want to see it, go ahead and see it. In 15 minutes, it'll be gone. Now comes Dr. David Anderson. He is a former United States Air Force officer, scientist, and flight test engineer, founder of a company called the Time Travel Research Center. This company has pioneered the development of a time warped field technology. Did you hear me? pioneered the development of a time-warped field technology that is demonstrating that real-time control is much closer than most of us realize. His company and research association are dedicated exclusively to advancing the science, technology, and research that will deliver practical time control for us all. Dr. Anderson, most, uh, his most recent publication, is a brand new video called Time Travel Journeys into Time. Ha <laughs> ha. This video traces the complete history of our views on time and time travel, from the ancient views of time to the latest groundbreaking technologies that are ready to change our world in the most exciting ways you can imagine. Here is Dr. David Anderson. Doctor, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Art. It's good to be here, and it's great to have you back on the air. Thank you. Uh, just uh, for grins here, because that's about all that are left after the, the program tonight, um, I take it you heard uh, at least a portion of the first hour. Yes, I did. Well, where do you come down uh, in all of that? Where, do you think uh, there is any sort of reasonable evidence that we did not go to the moon? Uh, what do you think? 
Oh, no, you're gonna put you're gonna put me on the spot here. Oh um, yeah, sure. That's what I do for a living. Well, you, you know, you know what's interesting. The only way I can answer that question is is that uh, um, it, it's kind of the same way I look at my life now. Even though my background is in hard science and physics and mathematics, I've I've learned that by opening up my mind to any possibility that has plausible scientific foundation, that right. uh, you can learn a lot. So I <laughs> certainly wouldn't exclude anything your guests were saying, and uh, I think it's worth listening to. That was a good answer. That was almost like the guy from NASA. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, Doctor, uh, there is probably nothing I'm more interested in, and I'm not even sure why, than time travel. It has always been a core, a really, really core fascination for me, uh, if we could travel in time. You know, you know, I had a remote viewer on the other night, uh, Ed Dames, who suggested that uh, there has been intervention uh, here on this planet, that uh, the intervention has been done by those things that we know as UFOs, but not manned by aliens. Uh, he said, uh, interestingly, rather manned by men, not exactly humans as we know them now, but humans from the future who have reached back to uh, try and uh, uh, fix the balance of power by sabotaging a couple of programs that would have upset the balance of power and keeping us from destroying ourselves. If time travel ever does become a reality, and, and I know probably you can argue, gosh, it already is, Art, and we'll get to that part, but... Uh, would something like that, that kind of manipulation, do you think the nature of time would allow that sort of manipulation? I think the answer is, is that absolutely yes. I mean, there, there is nothing within our, or first with nothing within our laws of mathematics and physics that would preclude that from being a possibility. Mm. And also you look at the, look at the evidence. Uh, you know, not only our legend, but our, our legend and folklore are filled with stories about UFO sightings and contacts with aliens from other worlds. Yes. Um, by kings, princes, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, common everyday people. Um, and it could be very possible that these stories are not about time travelers from a distant world, but instead that they're from our own future. Uh, and you look at the sightings, many of the creatures that have many human characteristics, maybe they're time travelers from our own planet visiting us from years ahead in the future. Well... In my mind, if time travel ever can be, or, or is going to be, then the obvious question, I forget who it was, some famous person said, well, then, where are the time travelers? And the answer might be, gosh, we're taking pictures of them all the time. I've got a, a very startling recent UFO photograph, uh, things that blink in and blink out. They don't just always zoom away. Sometimes they virtually disappear. Who's to say... These are not visitors from our own future. Yeah, that's a, a very famous. Uh, it was called. It was by Stephen Hawking, the uh, uh, the British physicist. Uh, <laughs> and he, it was called his chronology protection conjecture. <laughs> he said if, if time travel was possible, um, where are they? Where are all the time travels from the future? And he actually presented that almost as scientific evidence because of the lack of visitors. But you're right, absolutely, there is much evidence that. Uh, you know, possibly, you know, these alien sightings are uh, perhaps time travelers from our own distant future. So where are the time travelers? Uh, they're right here, and occasionally we even get photographs. Yeah. There's another commonly held belief, too, now in the scientific community that possibly, you know, any physicist will tell you that time travel may be very, very difficult, but it certainly doesn't violate the laws of our math and physics. The work we're doing, the work uh, we've seen by Dr. Wang from NEC within the last year in superluminal light uh, uh, propagation, um, shows that this is possible. Um, well, all right. A good example is Dr. Michio Kaku. He's one of our nation's uh, foremost theoretical physicists. Yes. And he agrees that time travel may well be possible, but then he talks about the power that would be required to achieve it, and putting things in perspective, uh, he's suggesting we would have to be in control of the power of a sun, or even greater, uh, power in order to uh, to actually um, I don't know bend time or to go back in time or forward in time uh, that we could do it when we get to that level I take it you have issue with that uh, you know actually that that's the if when all boils down to being said and done with our research we can talk about it we can talk about the applications the technology <coughs> excuse me um, 
But what, what essentially what our great accomplishment is is that we've found a way to create a, a time dilation with at a much lower energy level. That is the, the bottom line foundation of our entire research. A time dilation at a much lower energy level. All right, let's let's hit it one at a time. When you w w define the term time, time dilation, um, uh, essentially meaning that the, that the rate at which time passes can be sped up or slowed down is probably the simplest way to put it. The time can be sped up or slowed down. Correct. Uh, effectively resulting in in time travel. Uh, eventually, yes. I mean, right now, what we what we're doing is we're just uh, we can create a small self-contained what we call a time warp field, and within that field, we can we can accelerate the rate at which time passes or slow down the rate at which time passes relative to the time rate outside of the field. How do you know you're doing that? Uh, we've actually we've um, actually we recently um, uh, about two years ago, well, beginning about three years ago, we brought our first what we call our time warp field generators online. Uh, initially, in our first years, in 1997, uh, we did work with both mechanical and electrical clocks, and we demonstrated the time dilation effect. Uh, in 1998 was a big year for us because we did our first test on a living organism. We actually used uh, a living plant organism, and we were able to accelerate and slow down the life cycles of that living plant organism. So okay, again, one, one at a time here. You just used a term, time warp field generator. Yes. What is, is what is that, pray tell? <laughs> well, uh, essentially, the, the theory that we introduced, um, it's a theory I introduced back in 1988. It's called time warp field theory. It, it's, a, it's a discussion and approach and a technique that allows the creation of a, of a field that will allow you to accelerate or slow down the rate at which time passes. Uh, the generator that we use to create that field is called a time warp field generator. And by what means does it do that? Uh, in other words, what kind of field are you generating... I'm going to just take a stab in the dark here. Some sort of electromagnetic field, is well, it, or is electromagnetics? In, or can you not talk about this? No, I can talk. About, I can talk about certain characteristics of it. Uh, All right, and, is and, electromagnetic energy involved? Yes, it is. I knew it. I knew. It. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I must tell you, I did a program last night uh, in which I started getting these calls, doctor, from people who had. You didn't hear last night's show, did you? No, I didn't. Okay, not. people who have had MRIs, you know what an MRI is, right? Yes, I do. Incredibly large electromagnetic fields. And I started getting calls, doctor, from people saying, you know, I saw things, technicians who w would say, I saw things, entities, whatever you want to call them, and I've seen them for years working around MRI. And I would never talk to my my associates about this and a couple did and they were told just shut up keep your job you know but uh, I've always thought that very large electromagnetic fields uh, since we're electromagnetic beings after all uh, might distort something in a near field and allow something to be seen now I realize that's pretty far out but it, it relates in a way to what you're doing because what you're doing also is electromagnetic so does that sound so wild to you? Uh, it, you know, it's it, 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 it's difficult to say. Does it sound so wild? Um, maybe not. Maybe not. I mean, in our in our application, we use electromagnetics, but not necessarily in the same way that many people might expect us to say. I mean, our our generator is uh, um, very similar. I guess what I'd call a a, a plasma generator, more of like a, a plasma generator that people be familiar with in a high energy physics experiment. So you're saying you're, you use an electromagnetic field to contain plasma? Well, yeah, well, actually, that, 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 that's pretty close. Uh, we use it. We have an antenna that in, induces what we call a high-speed rotational magnetic field, electromagnetic field in the core. Uh, oh, then, my. Then we have an injector system that establishes a, a, a special environment, and then we use a high-energy laser array to, in, to induce the time warp field. So there is an electromagnetic component, but it's not... Uh, when, when, when we talk about time control technology, we quickly move to the Montauk project. And oh, the Philadelphia yeah, project. I, you and betcha. I was going to just stop you right there, and I was going to say, do you realize what you just described is so close to what... I, I've interviewed people supposedly involved in the Philadelphia experiment. They gave technical details, and they had large electromagnetic uh, fields along with rotating um, RF fields.
Yeah. Uh, and and that's starting to sound an awful like what you uh, just said. Actually, it's actually not completely. We do have a rotational electromagnetic field, yes. but it is a minor part of what we do. Uh, a critical part of what we do is is an injector system where we establish a uh, we use it we in induce a gas reagent into the core of our generator and then we use a high energy laser array. That reagent in the, in the laser array is really what initiates and controls the field. However, it cannot be initiated without the electromagnetic field. Once once we open up a time warp field, that electromagnetic field, the rotating electromagnetic field we have really tapers off. We use it for control, but it's not as important after the field is opened. As within the Philadelphia experiment and the stories of the Montauk project, mm -hmm. um, that was a key critical element. But you don't necessarily rule out the possibility that uh, in what was described in the Philadelphia experiment, or even in just very large electromagnetic fields, that anomalous things might be observed I, I, I certainly there's scientific plausibility for that. Uh, you know what's interesting, Art, is that in my background is 20 years um, as, as a military scientist, uh, um, doing what I do. You know, 20 years of background in mathematics and physics. But I learned recently, probably about four or five years ago, if, if, if I'm going to, you know, if we're, we're going to be able to move forward with our research, we have to look at it. The, the information on time and time travel from many perspectives, and I've become uh, I've become familiar with many people all around the world, uh, right here locally on Long Island. People like Peter Moon and Preston Nichols. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear stories of the Montauk Project. Some of them are very extreme. Some of them have scientific plausibility. But what I've learned is is that is that there is foundation in scientific plausibility in many of the stories about time and time travel, um, even outside of the mathematics and physics textbooks. You know, I talk with people from the Federation of Damon Her in Italy, a, yes. a cult that is based, their whole life is based on the, the study and worship of time. Well, I interviewed Al Bielek, and um, I, I will give this assessment. I don't know how much of the audience will agree or disagree, but in the early hours of the interview with Al Bielek, he described in great technical detail the magnetic fields, the rotating RF fields, how they did what they did on this ship, and what they were trying to achieve. And technically, it sounded... Truly, it sounded sound. It sounded as though it were based uh, in technical fact. Now, as the story continued and it reached the Montauk stage, I thought it began to get a little out there. But the early stages of what I heard about the Philadelphia experiment, they sounded technically pretty much correct, Doctor. Yeah, there's, there's a, actually there's a lot of information about... Uh... Uh, technical information about uh, the degaussing of ships that was, you know, these uh, large electromagnetic magnetic coils that were put on the ships for maybe degaussing the ship to yes. make them undetectable to mines. That's right. Uh, there, there, there's there's foundation in these stories, absolutely. Um, and and I, one thing I've learned is that it's 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 worthwhile to listen and to study and for everybody to make their own assessment, but don't close your mind to it because there is scientific plausibility in a lot of these. All right. So a time warp field generator. You have these. You've built them. You're using them, right? Yeah, we're actually on our, our third generation system right now. Third generation. Yeah, a lot of people in this country go, what? I haven't heard of this kind of research. What the hell is he talking about? Third generation time warp field generator? How well, could? How, why isn't this in the headlines? Why isn't well, this on the evening news? Well, you know what amazes me? Well, actually, actually, in many ways it has. We've been, we've been published in, uh, in many articles, many television shows around the world. Um, you know, Art, I think it goes back to a comment you made earlier. You said that time, tra t time and time travel was one of your favorite subjects. What oh, I don't yes. understand is why aren't more people asking this question? You know, for forget what we do and the research that we've been doing for 15 or 20 years and what everybody else is doing around the world. I mean, people, you know, it's my, my, my favorite dialogue is, um, People ask what time is. Well, well, time is a really curious thing. If you ask anybody walking down the street if they know what time is, they're certainly going to immediately say yes, absolutely. But when then, if you ask them to explain it to you, <laughs> they'll be at a loss, complete yeah. loss for words. And I, I challenge all your listeners to try it with a friend, a family, a stranger in the street. And what's amazing to me, I don't understand why more people aren't asking this question um, about um, about what time is it dominates our whole language our life our culture we use it in almost every other sentence that we utter every day but we don't understand it well i'm lucky in this regard uh i could ask a lot of people who probably are calling right now but instead i luckily have dave, dr david anderson here 
who's building time warp field generators. And I can ask uh, Dr. David Anderson, what is time? And that's exactly what I'm going to do when we get back. So prepare yourself. And I'm sure you are prepared for that. Can you imagine, folks, if you could fire back, say, to the Roman age? Check out a little bit of the atmosphere, something like that. We may be able to. All right. Time travel. Dr. David Anderson, who's really doing it and building things like time warp field generators. And trust me when I tell you, we're going to get back to that. But in a moment, we are going to talk about the nature of time. I guess it's pretty core to whether time travel is ever going to really be possible. Dr. David Anderson certainly says. All right, once again, Dr. David Anderson, and I suppose a time-traveling obstetrician would say, first you have time dilation, then you have a full-grown adult popping out. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, Dr. Anderson, I think it is important that we cover uh, the nature of time, what time is, because you must first understand that before you could ever hope to move through it, right? I, I think that's true. Okay. My, my first reaction should be Mr. Art Bell is very glad you asked that question, and he's going to answer it now, because for as much as I've met people all around the world, I still have not had anybody give me a good definition of what is time. Oh, no. It is, it is a fascinating question. But I'd certainly be glad to offer some insights, at least to... Uh, Give me your best, your best shot. Okay, well, um, you know, it obviously is a basic question to, to our conversation. You know, what is it that clocks are measuring? They seem to measure this uh, unseen medium we call time that continues on with a never-stopping force, like that river that drags us along. We can't fight it, fight it uh, moving us through life to death. Um, in some ways... Uh, um, uh, last time last time we spoke, I talked about two of my favorite quotes. One of them is a quote, time is the fire in which we burn. Hmm. Um, that maybe says a little bit. Maybe we don't want to understand what time is. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we can't answer it, because it's so linked to our mortality. No, I do want to know. I do want to know, and I want to even know about my own mortality and what may be beyond, if anything. And, and, and these two questions may coexist. And maybe maybe part of the answer is, is that... Uh, uh, time is a place where our rational minds bump into our own limitations. Maybe perhaps <laughs> what we consider to be time, <clears throat> this medium, is somewhat like the ether we used to thought that permeated the universe. And maybe it's just uh, something that's a product of our own biological and cultural evolution, maybe an illusion of our own mind. Maybe it is. I I've heard uh, various references that make some sense. In the beginning, biblically, before there was anything, there really could not have been time. Because there was no reference. In other words, if there was nothing, if there were not two bodies, planets or a sun and a planet or something moving around the other, there was no reference of change. So in a sense, there could not have been time. And so then once the Big Bang, which we won't bother to get involved with here, occurred, and there were objects traveling, uh, moving away rapidly, there was a measurement that could be made. Yes? Yes, as a matter of fact, there are many theories out there uh, by reputable physicists that say uh, time is a result of the expanding universe, or what we see as mechanical time anyway, as a result of the universe expanding. Yes. And that perhaps when it starts contracting, time will reverse itself. And then, and so, well, maybe it will. Um, maybe it will. And things will start running illogically backwards. Is that what would occur if that... Uh, that happened. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if I agree with that, but the, but but the, there is. I mean, it is a worthwhile discussion point. There are many theories out there on the subject. Um, okay. But 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 when you but when you talk about time being illusion, um, you know, the way we look at time uh, again is 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 a function of our own mind and, and biological and cultural evolution. You, you look at just within the United States. Look at the history of the Navajo Indians uh, uh, that seem to have many ties to many of these subjects in their language. Uh, in their ancient language, there was no past, present, and future tense like right. other languages. Right. They always talked about uh, events with regards to their quality of happening, not happening in the past or the future or someplace in time. No, you're right. It wasn't even a structure of their language. Uh, uh, no, but you're absolutely right. I mean, now we even have this atomic clock in Boulder that helps all our other clocks stay dead on time. But what are we measuring? What are we really measuring? We've 
We've successfully invented this this method, this clock. We look at it, it ticks, it's right or wrong, accurate or not, measured against something. But it is it not really all our own invention? Uh, you're absolutely right. It's probably, you know, in, in that case, there there is a mechanical aspect to time. We like to be able to measure things. Um, but what really is it that clocks are measuring? Now, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, time is a label we put on something we don't understand, much like gravity. You know, I, I, we could sit here and we could talk for hours about all the equations of gravity and, and the forces and all the formulas we have, but what they are are representations of, of something we observe. It's not a definition of why is, why is there gravity? Why do two objects, why are two objects attracted and pull towards each other? Uh, we don't know the answer why. And time, in a, in a way, is the same thing. It's a label we put on something to help make our lives a little bit easier. Well, with respect to gravity, I always thought we were held on the planet because of its mass only. But I'm told by people like uh, Professor Kaku that, no, we're actually here more because we're being pressed down on than we are held by the mass of Earth. So, uh, you know, the experts are a little confused over this whole issue. They can't really... I've heard gravity defined in an awful lot of different ways by very knowledgeable people. You know what's interesting when when we talk about what is time, one of the most one one, one of the most interesting people you could talk about the views of Homer, Plato, Aristotle, but there was a, a philosopher Saint Augustine, and he was the first one, and it was right around I think uh, 400, uh, the year 400, and he 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 the first one really to document and introduce time as an illusion of our own mind, and and what's interesting is. Um, it, when you look at what's happening in the new physics, um, uh, in, in the world of quantum physics, and you look at some of the things that are coming out of the particle accelerators and super colliders, um, they're more in tune with the views of the Navajo, the, the, the ancient Buddhist Hindus and Taoists, uh, that treated time as an illusion. Matter of fact, if you talk to a, uh, uh, somebody who's a, a master in the Buddhist religion, He'll look at you and he'll be confused as to why you think time moves. You know, they look at us and say, why do you think time moves? Time stays in its same place. The past, present, and future all exist at once. They're not well, separate. I'm sure you've heard the expression, time is God's way of ensuring that everything doesn't happen at once. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes. Oh, hey, is it? Uh, well, uh, so we, we have this thing, but you're suggesting you really believe, as they do, it's kind of an illusion. I think I think I stick to the ground that uh, that that time is really still a place where irrational minds bump into their own limitation. It's a concept that's difficult for us to understand. Um, you know, again, it's amazing to me. We've known since the 1920s the first scientific proof came in that time was not a constant. In the 1940s, it was proven over again 20, 30, 40 ways that yes, time is changeable. Um, you look at what happened, what's happened in the last 20 years. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Dr. Wang at, at the NEC who, who, who is able to inject a pulse into a season block and actually have it leave before it finished entering. Um, absolutely amazing. But how many people are walking down the street today fascinating with, you know, what is time? Um, Not enough. Don't, Not enough. Yeah, it's amazing. Maybe in some ways we shrink all the magic in, in, in our world and our universe to the size of our daily routines and material possessions. I don't know. Uh, but it amazes me mostly that more people are not fascinated or, or asking the question, you know, what is time? You know, what really is it? All right. Uh, that's probably as close as we're going to get. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a quick uh, tour of uh, a discussion of time. It doesn't mean that we understand it. You know, exactly. Uh, uh, I've, I've asked the question everywhere, and uh, I, I, I still am amazed. I think my favorite answer is somebody told me time is a sphere with wings. Sometimes the wings fly together and it moves forward. Sometimes they fly backwards and it flies backwards, and sometimes they just flap, fly around in circles on itself and it doesn't move. So perhaps right. that's the best. All right. Uh, you have constructed a... Where did you come up with the idea or the design concept for a time warp field generator? Well, actually, um, it was it was why I was doing work in the Air Force. Um, I, I my my specialty at the time was space time space time uh, physics navigation. Uh, why I was why I was a scientist in the Air Force, and we were trying to figure out why our satellites were drifting. I, I don't I don't know if many of your listeners would know, but for probably about thirty years, many people there was a, a problem with satellites uh, that were in orbit around the Earth, and that. Uh, 
you know, we had the models that the mathematical models that would show where the satellite should be, but at the end of every year, they were off by one or two or three meters. And are, are, are you referring? Long. Are you referring to, for example, the polar orbiters that could be tracked specifically, or the uh, geosynchronous satellites, or all of them? All of them. All of them. All of them. All of them. And, and it is anybody who's been involved in any 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 satellite research, uh, any astrophysics knows this is that satellite positions there was this mystery surrounding them that that they knew every year that they were going to be off in position by one or two meters and it was not due to error of equipment it was due to some phenomenon we didn't understand uh, well anyway we created a, a mathematical model to help resolve the discrepancy um, and after after I left the Air Force and, and further investigation to that we discovered a new relationship between time and energy that became the, the building block of what we're doing today well, what did you discover? In other words, why was there this error in an absolute calculation? Do do we now know? It's yeah, actually, actually, um, uh, it, it's a it's a phenomenon of, of of general relativity called frame dragging. What it means is that a massive body that spins um, has a tendency to twist time and space around it, oh. uh, even a body the size of the Earth or the Moon. And when we came up with our, our new mathematical model, it accounted for it. We didn't know exactly how we did it. We knew we accounted for it and solved the problem. It took a few years for us to really understand what was inside. Field uh, frame dragging? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a classical physics term, um, uh, frame dragging. It just means that a massive body will actually twist space and time to a very, very small degree around it. A, a, a body the size of the Earth or the Moon will twist it to a very small degree. Uh, now, obviously, the very large planets would, to a larger degree. Yes. And a something as as a powerful as a black hole, to an extremely large degree. Yeah, and, and something like the sun, for instance. We know that if we look at the uh, a radio signal from a distant quasar as it passes near the sun, or if we bounce a, a radio signal off a planet yes. uh, when it's on the other side of the sun or near the edge of the sun, we can actually measure... Um, the effects due to uh, the gravitational effects of the sun. So it doesn't take a, a body much more massive than the sun or the earth to see the effect. So it, the sun pulls it, actually, doesn't it? Yeah, it actually twists space and time around it. The, 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 the element of uh, gravity itself can, can dilate or change time. Um, the fact that a massive body is spinning, it adds another small effect to that dilation that is called frame dragging. Where it all, actually... right, all right, you know, I can buy that. Um, so taking that as the basis of, of something that can occur, you've designed the time warp field generator, and you claim that you can actually uh, uh, change, what's the right way to put it, uh, time, uh, achieve time dilation, using your phrase, with lower energy levels, yes. how low, relatively, can you begin to see? Uh, because, after all, uh, even though a, a planet may not exert uh, a lot of pressure on time and space, it, you have shown it, it does exert some. Yes. How do you then distill this to achieve it at a lower energy level? Because a planet's got a lot of energy, after all. Well, I'd like, I'd like to go back and, 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 and first comment on, on your question from Dr. Keiko. And, and I have a lot of respect for Dr. Keiko. Uh, his, his work is phenomenal. His view he presented is a very common view today that, that time travel to actually control or alter time rates would take a massive amount of energy. Yes, as much as the sun might have. As much as the sun might have. It's a good, very accurate number according to classical, classical physics. What we've done is in this model uh, th that was discovered when we were analyzing uh, and solving the satellite position problems, we discovered a relationship between time and energy. And maybe I can explain it to your listeners a different way. Okay. Um, we all know, we've all hold, as children, we've held magnets in our hands. Sure. Um, and we know that if you put two poles together, sometimes they'll push away, sometimes they will attract, um, attract each other. Mm -hmm. Now... If you hold them very close in your hands, it works fine. Well, what happens if you stand on one side of the room and you put the magnet on the other side and, and you rotate it around? It'll have no effect on the magnet on the other side. What happens if you take one magnet and put it in Los Angeles and one in New York? Obviously, it's not going to have any effect. Now, if you could build um, magnets that were you know, extremely powerful, is it, is it possible? Yes, it's possible within the laws of physics, but it's very impractical. Then you take the same time... So that's magnetism. Well, what yes. about electricity or electric fields? 
When the first radio came, it was a simple spark that would transmit energy only a few feet. Uh, could you do the same thing and use just an electric field to send a signal from Los Angeles to New York? And the answer is yes, but it would take a massive amount of energy. But what we know today... You mean that an electric uplink. field? You mean, an, uh, for example, the old spark generators? Exactly. They were gigantic uh, electric fields, very wasteful, very broad, very powerful. They would do the job, but not really very well. Not really very well. But as soon as, but, but when it was discovered that there was a coupling between an electric field and a magnetic field, what we call electromagnetic waves, which right. are, are your listeners, many of them are tuning to if they're not getting a real audio feed off your website. <laughs> That's um, true. Um, once we discovered that, now I can take in my hand a small battery, a single 9-volt battery, put yes. it in my hand and power a transmitter that can send electromagnetic waves millions of miles into space. You're exactly right. That coupling, as soon as it, it before, when there was just magnetism and electric fields, um, it was infeasible. Within the laws of physics, it would be possible, but it was not practical. That's what all we've done is discovered a coupling, just like between electricity and magnetism, between time and different forms of energy that allow this to happen at a much lower power level. And all right, I, I understand the analogy. It's a really good one. Uh, you're absolutely right about that. But I don't understand the specific thing that you have done that has allowed this. Well, the, the specific thing that we've done is um, we've we've created what we call a a a, a, a general relative. You know, when when you talk about uh, dilating time, people always talk about special relativity and uh, general relativity, meaning that you can dilate time two ways that are accepted today with very fast speeds or very heavy gravity. Um, our field is more along the lines of, uh, uh, of a general relativ relativistic effect. Essentially, though, you ask about the generator. We have an antenna configuration. We introduce this rotational electromagnetic field. It's very large. It's probably about, uh, uh, probably about seven meters high, uh, the antenna configuration itself, uh, so about 20 feet. Um, the time warp field generator itself, uh, we have injectors that inject a gas reagent that help us create a, a very large amount of energy when we initiate a field, we require a lot of energy. And you're um, talking just about a, an electromagnetic field, right? Yes. This is a rota rot rotating electromagnetic field. Um, we, we, we set that environment up. We inject a gas reagent. And then we inject, we have a, a laser array of 12 high-power layers lasers around the core of the field. Yes. And we use those lasers to excite the reagent to create the amount of energy to open up the field. Once the field is opened up, um, the... Uh, the power on the lasers is pulled back a little bit. The rotational electromagnetic field becomes a less important component. Initially, though, the electromagnetic field is important to make sure we have a stable field. And so, and the, and then all of this is you actually have an antenna. You you you, you um, load this into some sort of radiator, some sort of antenna. Yeah, actually, the, the antenna, the antenna itself, we have 16 elements around the uh, uh, around the generator that 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 help create the uh, uh, the rotational field in a way that'll contain. Um, I'll just say contain the energy better as we open up the field. What have you? What have you actually created? I understand you're using the rotating magnetics, you're using the lasers, and and then you have created something, and you can back off the energy levels, and yes. the creation continues. What did you just create, Doctor? What we created was, let, let's just say, it's, it's an area within space where within that area, and it's a spherical field, within that spherical field is an area where time rates will pass slower or faster depending on how we set up the field. Good Lord. Um, what sustains this field after you've backed off your power levels. Uh, well, in other words, you're, you're into some sort of a creation here that I, I, I'm i almost grasping, but I'm not quite there. What sustains this when you back off on the power levels? Well, it's uh, the sustaining part of it is, is, is um, not as confusing to us. Uh, essentially, when we open up the field and it becomes stable, when we back off the power of the laser array, we use we modulate the the, uh, um, uh, the lasers that are that are using to you know maintain that we use to maintain the field and we have an array of as I mentioned of twelve of them around the field today. Right. Um, they're used to control and keep the field stable. 
Um, we have a gas reagent. Sometimes during a test, we have to actually re, re, you know, uh, re-inject a gas reagent into the field to keep it stable. But uh, it's mostly primarily used to open it up. Um, yeah, but you've started something that you can then back away from and is self-sustaining to some degree, right? Yes, it is. It's very self-sustaining. The only thing that Ooh, we uh, maybe in, in in some areas that we have some questions is when we create this field. Um, it becomes a little confusing to us because we start not understanding what we see in terms of power levels. As a matter of fact, All right, there you are. Uh, doctor, hold it right there. We're at the uh, top of the hour. We'll be right back, folks. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Time is what we're talking about. The nature of time, how to travel in it. We've got a man who's actually doing that kind of stuff right now, Dr. David Anderson, who's built a time warp field generator. Time dilation at lower energy levels. What does that mean practically? Well, we'll find out. Uh, we're just going to cover a slight bit more of the technical aspect of it with this field that's created in a moment, and then we'll jump into some other areas. Now, uh, back to Dr. David Anderson, uh, who's located uh, way, way back east. Where are, where, is your, uh, where are your laboratories? Our laboratories are located on Long Island, New York. You know, interesting place, actually. Uh, a lot of interesting and sometimes worrisome research is being done on Long Island, isn't it? Well, yeah, with, uh, I guess at uh, the Brookhaven Labs here, and uh, um, I sometimes get a, get a lot of attention for different things, but actually it's a pretty quiet place. It's, it's what do, what place. do you think about Brookhaven? I mean, is there the possibility, just very quickly, that they could push a button and we could suddenly huh, have a minor bang, which uh, would be all it would take? Mm, I don't think so. Sometimes people ask us that uh, about our facility. They're afraid we're going to open up a black hole that's going to destroy the Earth. Uh, yes. I, I don't think it's. I don't. I don't think that uh, uh, that's a possibility. Actually. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to go right back to where we were. We were talking about the field that was created, and then you're able, of course, once the field is created, to back off on power levels. And there is some aspect of this that you don't fully understand. Yeah, that's correct. Um, um, one, one of the things that I, w I would, I would, uh, you know, first say uh, to ask your listen listeners is, is not to challenge these ideas, but to to challenge themselves a little bit. Uh, um, you, when you ask about the technical description, what we have is a, uh, it, it's like a plasma field generator. This, this is a plasma field generator is nothing new. It's been around for a long time. What we found a way is that in the boundary area. The outside of this plasma field generator, the boundary area has a unique characteristic that that it can actually isolate time rates. So time can move at a at a faster rate on one side, but move at an independent rate on the inside. And that's what we've done. Um, uh, there's there's many times a lot of mystique about this and a, a lot of doubt about the technology. Uh, uh, one one of my favorite objections is the objection that. To dilate time or to change time rates, it'll take an infinite amount of energy. Well, let's go back for a second. Our research has shown clearly that time rates can be changed at a much lower energy level than, yes. than what's been said in the classical physics. Look at the other law that just fell only about seven months ago, that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Well, guess what? That has fallen. It's been validated in labs all over the world that, yes, a light wave can a wave can travel faster than the speed of light, and when it does, it will move in a negative time direction. Um, before the theory was for anything to move faster than the speed of light, it would be impossible because it would take infinite energy. Now, a light wave has no mass, so there's not that type of energy. But mm -hmm. the concept that that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light is a dead one. Now, all, all the textbooks will tell you differently, but um, well, I, I kind of like. I, I thought your other analogy was very clear. The the one that talked about, for example, a spark uh, transmitter that's a blunderbuss making just noise all over all kinds of bandwidth, throwing it out all over the place, and yeah, you can get from here to there, but you've got to use enormous amounts of power to achieve it. Um, and you pointed out you can take a little 9-volt powered transmitter on, on the right frequency and hear it on the other side of the globe. So, I mean, you're exactly right. I, I understand the theory of what, what you have done here. Uh, 
I don't understand, and I guess you don't fully either, what keeps that field going uh, when you back away on it. That would seem to defy the laws what's, of physics. Well, what's interesting is, um, uh, you know, there's certain things we do understand. We know that inside the field, when we do certain things outside the field to modulate it, that we can create you know, a certain performance that we can accelerate time rates or we can slow time rates inside the field, actually make time move faster or slower. We know we can do that. We, 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 we can, we can reproduce it. It's, it's very predictable. What we don't know is necessarily all of the whys. Um, we also know that we see energy fluctuations. Uh, when we, when we pull back on power after we open up a field, we know that according to the laws of physics that we understand that it should take X amount of power to keep the field open. Precisely. What we see is sometimes requiring more, but sometimes requiring less power. Now, that's what really fascinates us because when we open up this field, well, either the laws of, you know, we, we have a field open that's being sustained at a lower power rate than our, our understanding of physics and our time warp field theory says is possible. So what does that mean? It means Maybe our equipment is wrong or our equipment is out of calibration or, or incorrect and it's not. Maybe the laws of physics are wrong, which we don't believe so, or the laws of quantum mechanics, and but, we don't believe you, that either. You, you can do it reliably, repeat, repeatedly, uh, or you said sometimes. Oh, um, okay. When I say that, what I mean is, is that we can create, when we create a time warp field, we can, I'll say it simply, we can adjust the time rate inside the field. We can speed it up. Oh. Maybe to about a factor of three to four times the time rate outside of the field. So we can actually make time pass three times faster inside the field, uh -huh. or we can slow it down. Uh -huh. When we slow down too far, the field becomes unstable. When you slow down too far, the field becomes unstable. Yeah. Um, so we, 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 does, that, does that suggest that ultimately uh, time travel going forward is going to be easier to achieve than, than going back? Oh, actually, we, we, that's, that, that's, that's a very accurate statement today, even without any knowledge of, of our research or any of the other researchers going on, research going on around the world. Yes, time travel in a forward direction is much easier and much more achievable, uh, today than time travel in a reverse direction. Huh. All right. Here's the next question I want to ask you. We'll leave the field for a moment. And let me ask you, how do you prove that you have accelerated or decelerated time? How do you do that? Within, well, done, within this field? We've done it, we've done it with, um, I'll say three ways and we're underway with our fourth way right now. Um, the first thing that we did in 1997 and 98 was to do, uh, a lot of work when we brought our first, uh, time warp field generator online. It was small, but it was enough to do the first experiments. Um, we were able to demonstrate it with clocks, or re let's just say re reference clocks. Okay. One clock outside of the field, one clock inside of the field. Right. And we are able to measure the, the 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 time rate differences inside and outside of the field. You're telling me you could actually see a clock in the field either running slower or faster than the reference clock. Yes, and we did it both with uh, both not only with uh, electronic but also with mechanical clocks as well because a lot of people you know, talk about the magnetic field effects sure, on electronic sure, equipment. Sure. Sure. So, that was our that was our first demonstration, which was really our our, our big breakthrough. Okay, before after, you leave that one, sure. how much difference in time could you observe? Well, uh, not not that it matters a lot, but because it it just demonstrates it. Period. But how much? Let, let me introduce a term because it's it's easier to talk about this way. If we have a field outside of the field, we call it we call the rate at which time passes the reference time rate. That's the time rate that we're seeing right now. Inside the field, we are able so far stably to accelerate the field, the time rate, 300% inside the field, which means a factor of three times faster. Which Good means, Lord. Which means when three hours pass outside of the field, we can have, uh, or when one hour passes outside of the field, we can have three hours pass inside. And we've been able Holy to... Smokes. Yeah, and we've been able to stably slow the time rate in the field down to about, I'll say about 35%, meaning that we could slow the time rate inside the field to, to that point. Uh, 35% of the reference time rate. So when 100 God. minutes pass outside, we can have 35 minutes passing inside. Uh, well, that's that's incredible. <laughs> that's, yeah, incredible. that's absolutely incredible. Oh, my God. And so then when you take the clock out, uh, there is, in one instance, a 300% difference, and you're sitting there looking at two clocks 
with that much difference? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Holy in, smokes. In, in some cases, when we initiate the field, um, we have to, uh, uh, you can't always visually observe the clock inside the field. Um, the, the field has a characteristic of Doppler energy up or down, mostly because of the time rate and the boundary of that plasma field. Um, when it does, sometimes the visual, um, I think everybody's pretty much familiar with the Doppler effect, the shift in frequencies. Yes. Uh, a time when you go across a boundary layer that has a time rate divergent, divergence, it has a, the effect of Dopplering frequency. So sometimes um, when we adjust the field, you actually see an object appear to uh, its frequencies, including its colors, to shift, which means eventually they'll shift out of the visible spectrum. It so, looks like they actually disappear, but they don't. Oh, my God. Really? So, in other words, at least visually on occasion the clock in the field to the eye disappears that's correct that's correct matter of fact a, a lot of people we we, we started a, a project when we first started this we called it project dark star and everybody thought it was a sinister weapon of mass destruction the reason Sounds we called like it, it yeah. the reason we called it dark star is that one of the first things that we learned when we put an object in the field and we 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 changed the time rate in one direction the actual visible light would be Doppler down as it passed through the field, so the colors would start changing, and then eventually the the the, the light signals, the color, the the visual optical image of that object passing through the field would be Doppler down so far up so far that it would actually disappear, and the field would become black. And it, how, so that's where how the were you able to from. how were you able to assure yourself? Because it must have been a really big question. Somebody standing there looking at this one. Oh my God! Look at that, and. Then the next thing would have been you would have wanted immediately to know is the object still physically there? Your answer is yes. How did you find that out? Well, the, 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 well, <laughs> I think we know it's physically there. The, the answer you is yes. Think? We're, 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 we're virtually certain. Okay, ninety-nine percent certain that the object is still <laughs> physically there. <laughs> one, one of the most one of the most interesting examples we do we use a mechanical clock that involves a, a series of uh, of rolling and dropping metallic balls. And when we, when we create that slowed time rate in the field, just before the object becomes not visible, you can see the clock, mechanical clock functioning at a lower speed. And you can see objects falling, these metal balls falling in the clock, actually slower than, uh, noticeably slower than they would if you were holding them outside of the field. And again, it's due to the time rate, the time rate divergence. And, and that's a real powerful, that's, that's probably from a, from an experimental standpoint, it's the most worthless experiment. But from an emotional impact, when people see that experiment, they uh, uh, freak they out, amazed, yeah. freak out, yeah, freak out. I would. God, I'd love to see that. And then, then it virtually to the eye disappears. Would it disappear to a camera as well? Absolutely, because all it is is, is visible light. And actually, this Dopplering effect is is a a, a a huge you know problem we have because you got to remember what we have. We have a 12 laser array firing into this this field generator. Right. Um, okay. It Doppler's energy. You know, our, our our laser energy. When we are accelerating the the the, the field, uh, the time rate field. When the laser energy hits the boundary layer, that plasma field. I'll call it a plasma field. Yes. It's Doppler'd up, which means very quickly it can get to ultraviolet, ultraviolet, and eventually gamma radiation, harmful radiation. So when we accelerate time rates and we have a living organism inside the field, we eventually, essentially are putting it in a radiation cooker when we try to go too fast and accelerate time rate. And, and, and doing that more stably with lower power is important to us. All right. That was the first experiment. Now, I'm going to sidetrack you for just one second because, sure. again, I'm blown away. I had this character, Dr. Anderson, uh, near... Um, uh, out in KCMO uh, uh, territory, about 25 miles from KCMO, uh, our affiliate. And I've, I've got to tell you, I called him Madman Markham. He, he was a young fellow who tried to make a time machine. And you know what he did? He ev eventually went out and stole a whole bunch of power company transformers. All right? Okay. For which he went to jail. I mean, I talked to his parole officer. The guy actually stole these transformers, uh, hooked them up backwards to create this gigantic voltage, put together an electromag uh, electromagnet affair, and modulated it with lasers and claimed that he was going to be able to time travel. He had actually thrown, I forget, a screw or a nut through it or something, that the first model he made, 
and the damn thing disappeared and then reappeared. Now, this is a, you know, a wild-ass story. I admit that. But it starts to sound an awful lot like, or at least uh, close to, some of what you're doing. See, now, that's, that's, that's interesting that you say that, because, you know, you're right. On the surface, it sounds like a wild-ass story. Now, people say our experiment is like the... Uh, the technical description of the Philadelphia, it's absolutely nothing like it. We're using lasers to create the energy, not the electromagnetic field. Uh, we're more similar to a plasma generator than a, than a magnetic field, um, a pure, simple magnetic field. But what you're describing that, that Madman Markham did uh, has much more correlation to uh, what we're doing. Well, uh, again, it's interesting. Just, he sounds just, like an interesting person. Oh, well, he was a very interesting person. Why do I say was? Because... As I said, he lived 25 miles outside Kansas City. I had all kinds of contact with him. He had rented a warehouse, had purchased a bunch of... of, of some of my listeners helped him. He got these giant transformers. He was making this gigantic model. And for a mystery, we've never heard from the guy again. I mean, he's flat gone. It's been years now. And that's exactly what he was working on, these giant magnetic fields modulated by lasers. And I just I couldn't resist. I mean, it just sounded just like what you're doing. Maybe he'll show up one day when you least expect it. He said that. <laughs> he said that. <laughs> and I thought that when he walked through this thing, he would either turn into so much ash, or maybe he achieved what he was trying to achieve. The guy had cojones. Do you, do you know? Do you know that, that that's our biggest problem too? Is that it, when you when you say when somebody when you somebody steps into something like this, turning into ash? Uh, when we did our testing on uh, on living plant organisms and bacteria, bacteria, one of the problems that we've had is was that number two? Uh, yeah, that was that was actually plants were number two and the bacteria was number three. But uh, um, the biggest problem is is that we're putting so much energy into this. Um, we have to be very careful or we create a radiation cooker, and, and which yeah, is very harmful yeah, to yeah. a living organism. Yeah. Well, when you tried it with plants and then you said an organism, what, what happened? Well, what was interesting, when we first did, did, did their experiment with plants, you know, we have a spherical field. When, initially, when we started our, our experiment, only those seedlings that were located at the very core of the field survived the experiment. Now, as we get better and better with the field, you know, when we did our first test, we put um, we we used a set of seedlings uh, that had a very predictable germination and life cycle, and we were able to demonstrate you know the acceleration and slowdown factor. But we also at the same time destroyed 90% of the sampling of seedlings that were inside the field almost in every experiment. But in the 10% you did not destroy, what were you able to demonstrate? We were able to clearly show clearly show that the uh, uh, that we were able to alter the time rate. See, we, the, the, the species, I, I can't remember the name of the species, the Latin name for it, but, uh, and we have consultants who help us with this, but, uh, had a very, very predictable germination cycle and life cycle. What we're able to show in that the, the, the samples inside the field versus the samples outside of the field experienced a much greater time, uh, time rate and a shorter life cycle and vice versa. I, I take it because 100%. acceleration is easier. Than, than the reverse, that you would accelerate them, uh, it would be your best demonstration. So, in other words, a seed put in there uh, versus the control seed outside the field would be well into germination? Yes. Holy oh, mackerel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually, accelerating time rates in our tech, not just when, when, when you talk about uh, high-speed rocket ships to the future, it always is time travel to the future is easy. Accelerating a time rate is easy for us. The only limitation we have is the amount of power that we're putting in. It's so high that, again, when we accelerate time rates too much, um, uh, the upper limit, we can go. We can go. We can accelerate time rates inside the field as fast as we want, but at 300%, there's enough energy that it's going to kill any living organism inside of it. At 200%, 250%? Now, uh, do you think, uh, since you're uh, constantly working on ways to refine this and, and therefore use less energy, do you think that ahead there's going to be a way to use less energy, achieving greater effect or more time dilation. Absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, in our um, in our first our first time warp field generator, um, a short story had a field size of only three to four centimeters. When we moved the field size from three to four centimeters up to thirty to forty centimeters, we cut the amount of power huh. needed for that that ten times larger field by a factor of ten. So we increased the field side 10 times, but we cut the power by 10 times because we learned more. Holy smokes. Now, 
All right, uh, listen, we're, we're at a break point here, Doctor. Okay. Uh, hold on, we're at the bottom of the hour. Do you believe all of this is going on right here in the good, good uh, USA, good old USA, right in uh, on Long Island? And we've got the man who's doing it, Dr. David Anderson. So you might just be hearing something new tonight. Are you surprised by what you're hearing? Intrigued? <laughs> I am. Stay right where you are. This is Coast to Coast AM. All right. In a moment, we've got somebody who's got a question for Dr. David Anderson. He's a curious fellow. He's eternally curious. And so we're going to let him ask a couple of questions. We'll get right back to it. All right. I can't resist. Dr. David Anderson doing a fabulous job tonight uh, describing his research, laboratory research ongoing right now. Dr. Anderson, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Here's this curious guy who's still awake after having a, uh, uh, a no doubt, a uh, invigorating um, uh, hormone-producing uh, debate in the first hour. Richard C. Hoagland. <laughs> well, hey, I'm Richard. up working on the new book. Yeah, all right. So, All right, so a couple of questions, right? Yeah, uh, Dr. Anderson, I heard you oh, about a year ago when you were on Art Show the first time, and I tracked down your website through Keith Links, and I couldn't really find any specific information. In tonight's interview, you're providing a lot more details, but the thing that, that I want to know is, have you ever heard of the work of a Dr. Bruce De Palma, brother of the um, famous director Brian De Palma, a physicist, who well, about 20 years ago was duplicating, or actually you were duplicating what he did, uh, replicating very similar phenomenon with purely mechanical rotating systems. What did what exactly did he do, Richard? What was well, involved? He basically took a uh, uh, radio, uh, not radio, a uh, record changer turntable, standard, you know, one of those old Victrola types. Right. And he put it under, with proper shielding, a an FM receiver. And he rotated it at 33 RPM and 78 and, and 45 and all that. And found that there was a distinct frequency drift that went away when he stopped the rotation. You mean a Doppler shift? Not well. No, there was a frequency shift in the in the receive frequency of primary stations on the uh, dial. Well, that could be a, a described as a Doppler shift. Well, a Doppler would be if there had been motion, relative motion between... Well, you, you've got motion, though. You've got the turntable going around and around. But there's no... In other words, you, you don't have a motion between the receiver and the turntable. The turntable sitting under it, you know, kind of like right angles. Anyway, that was one phenomenon. All right. Have you heard of that work at all, Doctor? You know, no. I have. Well, have I heard of similar work? Yes. Have I heard of Dr. De Palma? No. Uh, the similar work I've heard of in, in the former Soviet Union, they did a lot of work with uh, a, a small uh, metallic rotating cylinders uh, half immersed in, in, in water um, and trying to, I mean, there's, there's many you know, uh, attempted documented papers out uh, available on the Internet and other sources about some of that work, but I'm not familiar with Dr. Palmer now. Okay. His, his other experiment was he took a Bulova Accutron watch. Remember those? Sure. With a little tuning fork? Yeah. And he did the same thing. He had it shielded so there was no electrical uh, potential problems. And when he rotated it, the Accutron would change time. It would change relative speed. It would slow down. He... He was not of these experiments able to accelerate the phenomenon much as you're reporting tonight, but he was able to retard it and compare the Accutron after the the run. You know, I, I, I forget what the numbers are. They're available on a website. The actual stuff is published. I can email you the links tomorrow. You can take a look at it. But it was significant, and I've been trying for years to get some folks to replicate it, because it demonstrates that one can interfere with this energy relationship we call time at much lower energies than the standard guys like Kaku and others think is possible. All right. Well, listen, Richard, thank well, you. Well, there's one other one. One other one, okay. The most interesting one is the biology, because he put uh, ordinary lawn grass ah. on top of the turntable. The lawn grass was stationary. There was a metal shield to shield from electrical effects. The, ro the turntable rotated at the 33 R and the third RPM for several days, and the control experiment in a dark room with ambient light so there was no phototropic effect had a uh, similar gadget sitting, you know, still with grass growing over it, non-rotating. And the grass growing over the rotating turntable 
grew in a very particular geometry and faster and farther than the grass in the control. All right, Richard, as always, thank you, my friend. Uh, we'll do a whole show soon. Excellent. All right, Richard, later. it was nice speaking with you. Um, uh, all right, well, so some of that does kind of sound like some of what you have done, uh, although yeah. if, if, if using a, a different uh, plan. Yeah, what's, what's interesting to me is uh, um, I'm, I'm more, in, in some ways I show my, my conservatism more from the classical physics world, but what always amazes me in the former Soviet Union um Many facilities, many research centers were doing work with mechanical systems to accomplish uh, time dilation. And I, I got to admit that I'm, I'm not an expert on the mechanical, the mechanical end of systems. I, I can talk more about classical uh, sure. physics from the electromagnetic uh, relative, relative, relativistic. All right. Again, your first experiment involved clocks, and that was very dramatic. The second one involving seeds and and plants, very dramatic. And what was the third and the latest? Uh, the third, we've been we've been working with uh, uh, different strains of, of of bacteria, trying to uh, we've demonstrated on a living plant organism that our field, um, other than the ninety percent kill rate, uh, can actually uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> accelerate a, a living a process in a living plant organism. Now we're moving on into uh, a single single celled um, uh, organisms and uh, different types of bacteria. Uh, we have not made a a very controversial point with us surrounding us, we have not made, nor do we intend very soon to make a, a step to vertebrate animal testing, which is a, is a, is a big move. That, that's something that's not on the horizon probably for at least uh, a year or two. You know, that's, uh, it, that's really interesting. Uh, most, uh, th there's a great deal, it's very controversial, of, of animal experimentation that goes on. Uh, why are you hesitant yet to give it a try? I mean, after all, just an animal. I, I'm, I'm taking a position I don't believe in. I'm just <laughs> throwing it at you. Why is it not irresistible for you? Well, it is. What's, what's interesting, it is very, very tempting to us. Uh, first off, uh, we know that we can produce we, we can produce performance, repeatable performance and results inside our field. We know we can do that, but we don't understand all the reasons why. Like I said, sometimes we don't understand why it requires less power than, than we expect it to. We right. also have that... Right the risk to living organism. We would like to understand more about why the field does what it does. Why does it, when we slow down the time rate, why does the field collapse and, and kill these living, living, uh, uh, these plant seedlings? Well, you know, what, why does, the, the reason why they, the reason why the plant seedlings are damaged is, is because the field, the, the boundary of the field actually collapses. So the core of the field becomes much smaller. And any plant seedling outside of that smaller core gets cooked. Um, or, or is damaged, whichever way you want to look at it. So you don't feel you have sufficient control of it yet. To yeah, that's one. That, that's one. First off, I want to understand it better, and, and so does everybody on my team. Second off, um, uh, we already have enough attention uh, uh, in different groups who would, who think that uh, we, as a, a, a human race, should not be experimenting with time, just like with genetics and cloning and and uh, nuclear power, even even though that's an older story, there are groups that protest. If we moved on to vertebrate animal testing without... Yeah, I know uh, you'd be in trouble. We, we, we would just be... We're already... But those who say you shouldn't even be investigating this area, they're full of it. What right. do they know? Yeah, well, you know, the, the benefit of this technology uh, um, uh, for, for good applications, everyday applications, is, is, is it really is staggering. Well, could this ultimately lead in your opinion to real time travel and by that i mean i hop in a chair surrounded by this field that you now have under control in some years uh and i can actually go to uh, uh, three years away three, three years hence i'll pop out on the other side and i'll be three years in the future I think I, I think eventually it will be seriously possible. I, I, I there's no reason why it wouldn't be possible. However, I think in the next uh, 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 four or five years, the, the applications that will be seen will be more using time-controlled fields to accelerate research, medical, using uh, a, 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 a time warp field to slow down uh, a disease. Uh, progression or for disease treatment sure. is probably the hottest area that uh, 
that we have attention and, and are doing research on right now. Okay, fine, but but you're not ruling out what I just said. I am not ruling out what you just said. There's no matter of fact. If any of us, it's it's kind of for us. It's the holy grail of uh, space time physics to be able to actually jump into a, a field and uh, okay, doctor. Into the future. Okay, doctor. If I if I were to do that, and now we'll enter the realm of speculation, specifying that having specified that. If I sat in this chair in the field and I went three years into the future, what would you see in the chair after I left? What would what would be seen in the chair after you left? At that rate, when you went went into the field, this I'm talking purely optical now. I'm not talking yes. about uh, moving into a parallel universe uh, or anything like that. Purely optical. Uh, if we accelerated that time rate field, we would see we would see the field become black. And essentially, you disappear. You, we wouldn't be able to see you. The field would have a very uh, opaque appearance. So I would now, for all intents and purposes, not exist in this timeline. Um, I, I think I think physically you exist in this time rate time timeline, but essentially you move forward three years. But maybe you move forward in the three years outside of the field. Maybe only in uh, uh, two days inside the field. So in your time, you pass two days, and then you come out on the other end three years later. Huh. Would I? Where would I land in three years? Uh, assuming that you still had, is assuming you still had the seat there. I guess I'd land in the seat. Yeah, that, that's but, it. but if your lab got in financial trouble <laughs> and they put a shopping center in, what would happen to me? Well, well, being that you're still in in the same physical universe, you're just inside a field that is blocking the optical, I um, mean, the optical path because of the dopplering. Um, if if I'll make you a promise, Art, if you jump in the field and we have to sell the lab, uh, we'll make sure we turn the field off and let you step out uh, before we just. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but still, in all, uh, if the field were to stop, I would be instantly back. Or, yes. or could I go to the future and stay there? No, the, no, the, the, no, no, no. The, the answer is once you move inside that field, you're, 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 you're um, th those, you know, you, you, once you're inside the field, an object that experiences an, a, a faster time rate, yes, is, is moving, is, is moving through time faster than outside right. or slower time rate. If we put you in that field and retard the time rate, so in two days, three years past us on the outside, yeah, yes. you're going to come out age two days. Um, Do you remember the H.G. Wells Time Machine movie? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember when he pushed the lever forward, uh, he saw things racing by him. He saw events. Uh, of course, he went very far into the future, but things raced by him. If Art was sitting in the seat and you had the field going, what would Art see? What would you guess that Art would see? Uh, first off, I think you would see you would see nothing while you're inside the field. You would not, you would see nothing through the boundaries again because of the dopplering effect. Anything that was visible light outside of the field initially, if if you were moving, if the time rates were only accelerated or slowed down to a small degree. You could see through the field boundary. We, we can do that today. But if you're talking about putting a person inside a, a field generator that size and accelerate them so they can move forward, forward, or, or, or backwards in time, um, you're, you're, you're really, you're really talking about a doppling effect that's not going to allow you to see any visible light through the field. All right. As, as the technology presently exists. That is correct. Yes. Okay. But all right. Then let's reduce it down to a smaller acceleration. If I were sitting in to inside the field, not cooking to death, Okay. And I was able to see outside the field. What would I see? Would I see you moving very slowly? Or would I see you moving very fast? Okay. If if um it, it depends on which way we accelerate the field, but in one case yes, you would see you would see the motion outside of the field being slower like when we do the mechanical clock with the dropping metallic balls. Yes. Um on the other hand, you would see you would see objects moving faster and people moving faster outside of the field. Uh huh. Uh huh. Do you think? Do you think that's all? Uh, you you really believe it's all within the realm yeah, of? of... I, I, I actually we're we're demonstrating it today, and, and there's there's nothing there's honestly there's really nothing extreme about this. The the real extreme thing will be. Can we slow down time rate inside the field? The answer is absolutely yes. Can yes. we speed it up? That's the easy part. Um, 
No, uh, our, but our can we is. reverse time inside the field? That is something we do not know if we can do. We, we do not know that yet. We know that we can put, we, we, we believe that the technology will allow putting a living person or animal um, inside the field and to slow the time so that um, while years pass on the outside, only a few days or a few minutes eventually here, pass here. on the inside. So essentially you move into the future without aging. But what we can't do right now is we, we, we can slow the time rate like that or we can speed it up so you go, you age faster uh, than outside, which I don't think most people would want to do. Um, but we don't know if we can actually reverse time yet. Okay, but how about this? How about the future? When your technology is refined, when the power levels are much lower and time dilation is achieved with a 9-volt battery, okay. um, and could I conceivably take a field with me? And I guess what I'm asking is, is there any way you can conceive in the future that a human being could move from whatever year they're in now to several years or many years in the future and keep a stable field with them, keeping them there? Oh, well, the, the answer is once you're there, you're there. Okay, in the case of, uh, in, in the case of the field, once, once, once you, if you were inside, if you were inside, theoretically, if you're inside our time warp field and we slowed the time rate so that only two days would pass why three years passed outside, yes. when we turned off the field, you're not going to go back. You, you've only aged two days. I mean, this is pure classical relativistic physics. You've aged two days why everybody in the world around you has aged three years. When you step out, uh -huh. that's it. You're there. You're there three years in the future, having uh -huh. only aged two years over two days over the three years. Uh -huh. uh, the, the field, maintaining the field is not an issue. It's uh, not an issue at all. So I could wait until interest rates got real high, go buy a CD, have you suspend me for a while, just age a few days, come out and collect all kinds of interest. Now, there you go. It's... <laughs> Ah, ah, ah. You know, there's an experiment I haven't thought about trying yet. Actually, <laughs> many we we have many many ideas along those lines, but uh, we better not go there. Actually, we we really oh, hope no, that I don't I don't mind going there at all. I mean, how well, if stocks, for example, a little risky. Uh, CDs a pretty sure thing, right? Yeah. So, so there'd be ways of profiting from such a technology. There there would be, right? What else have you thought of? Absolutely. Well, you know, honestly, in our heart, uh, you know, we, we all sit around and we, we joke when we have the time, which we have very little of. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, we really hope that, that the first fielded applications in, 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 in the next few years are going to be in, uh, in research, medical research, uh, in, in, or medical treatment. Probably not medical treatment because we have to move the vertebrate animal testing, which is going to take about two or three years. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, But... The application of our technology to help the medical, uh, the search for, in medical research for new cures and treatments for diseases, uh, has a tremendous amount of potential. Well, in that area, uh, just as an example, wouldn't there be great benefit to r reversing time so that uh, a disease that had progressed to a certain level could be, in essence, regressed? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, that's the, uh, um, one, one of the, the biggest areas, and uh, that this is really, um, uh, I, I got to tell you, 60% of our research is based on refining the technology and developing it so it can be used for this. Uh, initially, it'll be used in medical for accelerating uh, cure times in, in, in research, uh, in, in test experiments for you know, development of cures and treatments for diseases. Eventually, though, the hope is that you will actually be able to use it on a living person for the stasis or the regression of a disease. Yikes. And you know, why haven't you been on Good Morning America? Why haven't you been on the Today Show? Why haven't you been on the NBC Evening News? 2020? I, yeah. I don't know. All of them. I, actually, believe it or not, we, 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 have, we have been on NBC. We have been in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we do keep a little bit of low profile. Actually, this year is is an exciting year for us because we will be bringing all of our research public before the end of the year. How are you going to do that? Well, a um, big press conference, that kind of thing? Well, the first thing is a lot of our, our early work is available under Freedom of Information Act. I think many of your listeners know how to find that. Oh, uh, they do. Um, and and, and they, they can look up some of the early work uh, prior to 1988. All right, Doctor, um, hold on. We're, we're at the top of the hour, and we'll be right back. But remember, folks, when you do hear that big press conference, just remember, you heard it here first. This is Coast to Coast AM.
Good morning, everybody. My guest is Dr. David Anderson, and we're talking about time travel. Practical, real time travel. Has that occurred to you? <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. And you may recall several years ago, a man who makes time machines sent me a time machine. I have one, and I have one component of it that I want you to see. Now, this component consists of a, a thing that weighs about five pounds. I mean, this sucker is really, really heavy. It's an electromagnet, and it plugs directly into the wall, 110 volts. It's a big electromagnet. His premise was, you take this magnet in conjunction with the rest of his machine, and you place the electromagnet on your chest and plug the damn thing in. Well, it's an electromagnet, all right? It's gigantic. And if it were sitting on your chest, I'm holding it on the webcam. If you'll go to my webcam photo right now, I'm going to leave it up there tonight. You'll see me holding this electromagnet. You can see the cord on it. I have never plugged it in, nor have I used the rest of the machine yet. I've, I've always been afraid to because this would create, and he even admitted it gets very hot, creates a gigantic electromagnetic field directly on your chest. And I've always wondered whether that was really a good idea or not, you know? So I've never really had the guts <laughs> to plug it in and put it on my chest, or put it on my chest and plug it in, I guess, in that order. But I wanted you to see the electromagnet. I'm holding it in my hand. If you'll check out, if you go to my website and you click on the left on program, you'll see uh, Art Bell Studio Cam. Take a look at that photograph. Take a look at that electromagnet. Would you put that on your chest and plug it in? I don't think so, as Ross Mitchell would say, but you might. All right. We'll be right back with Dr. Anderson. Just like that. Through time. Can you imagine? It may be possible. Once again, here is Dr. David Anderson. And uh, Dr. Anderson, by the way, has got to, uh, I don't know, fly somewhere in the morning, and so we'll have him only here for this next hour, I fear. You're, you're taking off for someplace, right? Yes, I have to, I have to leave here about 6.30, so uh, to head for the airport. Uh, doctor, you have a videotape. This is something new from, what, a year ago when we talked. Yes. Uh, what is this videotape? What's in it? It, it's called Time Travel Journeys into Time. Yes, it's a, it's a new video documentary um, uh, completely about time travel. Uh, I, I guess the best way to describe it is that uh, we, we tried to um, uh, challenge people to think about time and time travel by taking them on a journey through uh, the entire history, including the real science of time control technology, time travel itself. Um, we started with uh, the you know the early beliefs about what time was. Uh, we talk about time from the standpoint of philosophy, religion, uh, ancient views, uh, even touch on art, but really move very quickly into the science and technology and a lot of the new ground-breaking research is being done all over the world today. How about your research? Is that in there? Yes, it's included. Actually, uh, we, we have more detail on our research in, in, in that video documentary and uh, uh, like I mentioned, this year we're planning on uh, uh, really taking a lot of our research uh, more public than we have in the past. All right, uh, let me let, oh, let's uh, let people know how to get. How, how do you get it? Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, if your viewers are interested, in, we have our, our association's uh, our website is at uh, www.time-travel.com. Oh, we've got a link up already. Okay, great. But but how do you get the tape? Uh, the video itself right now is available. It's just been released. It's available for purchase through our website. It'll be in distribution in your local video stores and really? uh, on the major uh, major online uh, uh, video shops uh, probably within the next uh, four to six weeks, depending on uh, oh. where you buy. No kidding. Absolutely. Uh, so there's no 800 number to call? Uh, not right now, no. Uh, too bad. All right, so... Uh, if somebody has a computer out there, they can go to my website right now where we've got a link. Just jump right over, and you can order it online. And if they order it, how soon are they going to get it? Uh, it's available. It's in stock, available for shipment right now. So typically within uh, within four to five business days. <laughs> All right. Well, then you're going to get a lot of orders. I hope your website is sturdy. It's uh, quite actually our... 
our, our website now gets on the order of several million hits a month. We've, as a matter of fact, after your show last year, we were motivated to move to a high volume server. I <laughs> see. Yeah, we motivate a lot of people to do that, actually. <laughs> you know, we were quite impressed last year. I, literally, seriously, we did. We moved to a, we moved to a high volume server after your show last year because unfortunately we crashed once as a result of all the traffic you brought. <laughs> yeah, we te we teach lessons in bandwidth. All right, uh, listen, I've got a lot of people who'd like to talk to you, so let's open the line and see what we get out there. How about that? Okay. All right. First time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. David Anderson. Hi. Hello. Hello. Where are you? Uh, Mount Healthy, Ohio. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anderson, I was curious. I, I caught the uh, earlier part of the show, and uh, you were talking about your plasma generator, and I was wondering if it requires an MHD reactor. An MHD reactor? Mm -hmm. um, no, it's when I said a plasma generator, it's like mm -hmm. a plasma generator. Typically, what we do is is we use a rotational electromagnetic field uh, in an open air environment. Um, we inject a, a gas reagent into the center of the field, um, and then we use a laser array to excite that. Now, the combination of the, the laser array modulating the different twelve lasers and that electromagnetic field. Um, help us establish and open the field. It, it is like a plasma generator. Um, You're just uh, ionizing it, a gas field. Uh, to, 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 yeah, to create the initial power required to open up the field, yes. You, you could say that simply is that uh, we're using that to ionize it, if you want to say that. The reagent is used mainly to generate the amount of energy we need to open the field. And but it's not, it's, not, it's not your classical plasma generator where you're going to have a, a big... Uh, the large iron core, cylindrical core, uh, with, with the heavy electromagnets. It, it's not the same type. The, the general approach is the same. Um, your con, um, control system, um, I, it, it seems to me it must be a very um, interesting control. Uh, I was kind of wondering if you're employing um, a squids interface with any of this. Uh, no, but you're right. The control, the, the control interface is um, is probably. When, when you look at our research beyond, beyond the theoretical and, and some of the experimental applications that we're doing, um, one of the biggest, one of the most complicated parts of our system, honestly, is the control. Uh, I mentioned that we had six injector arrays, uh, injectors around the field. They're actually injector sensor arrays. Um, I'm trying to think if we have an image. We might have some images of that on our website. You might take a look there. Young lady, um, may I ask you a question? Yes. How do you know enough to be asking these questions? I'm a physicist. Great. Good answer. Great. This is good. It's good. I enjoy, these, I, enjoy, I enjoy these types of conversations. Yeah, essentially, on every injector sensory, each of the six, we, we are pulling in 43 data points. And one of our biggest challenges is, is that our stability, when we retard time rates inside the field, uh, keeping the field stable is difficult. We, we, we try to do it with brute force. We read in 43 data points from six uh, injectors. You can do the math. We feed that. Um, into into our control system, uh, and then we in turn try to modulate the field uh, real time. And it's one of the biggest challenges we have right now because we cannot keep the field stable. We feel if we could modulate it faster, um, uh, that we'd be able to maintain the stability. So what we've done now is we're trying to, instead of take those 43 data points, we're looking for key characteristics in the, in that data stream and data signal, and we're trying to use those instead of the entire data stream to modulate the field. Um, I, I have two more questions, if that's all right. Go, sure. go. Um, and one of the questions I had is, are you um, seeing any residual field diffusion in any of your uh, temporal bubble models or field models? Uh, okay, when, when you say diffusion, I can interpret that a couple different ways. When, 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 you, when you say the field did, uh, Do you see the field spilling over or becoming unstable at uh, specific parameters or yes. Uh, interfaces? Yes, absolutely. And, and actually, this is this is the biggest area. As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd, I'd hope if, if maybe possible, if you have some experience, experience in this area, you might you might send an email off to the side. But it's our greatest challenge right now. When we when we begin to across that boundary layer, when we create a retarded time rate on the other side of the layer, when we retard, that's where the field gets unstable, and we don't know why. Hmm. Um, what happens is typically. Um, let me say the boundary of the field has an outer diameter and inner diameter. What happens is when we retard the time rate so far, we get fluctuations in the inner diameter. Are you when, when we get that fluctuation in the inner diameter, it essentially collapses when we retard the time rate mm -hmm. too much. And that Doppler effect that is typically constrained in the, um, in the bound, thin boundary layer of the field now 
is extended across a wider area of the field closer to the center of the core and when those when when our our uh, our samples are inside the field and they're exposed to that part of the, of, of the core that is where they're damaged they're damaged by the doppler effect because anytime you have a time rate diversion when you look at it and and you have the, the a time rate divergence across a layer of space it also has the effect of dopplering both in an up and down direction depending on which way you're going and where you're modulating the field and, and that's what we don't understand. And uh, you're using just standard interferometric uh, methods in controlling this? Or is it a distributed system or a smart system or using fuzzy logic? No, it's, it's a distributed system. Mm -hmm. It's not fuzzy logic. Uh, and we, yes, we do. And, and we have uh, on the injector sensor array six of them. We have six points outside the field where we use uh, interferometers. Okay. You know what? She sounds like she ought to be working for you. And, you know, I'm... I'm <laughs> <laughs> You know, actually, in a way, I don't mean to use your show to uh, uh, to look. We one of the things that um, you know, our our background and on our staff here is is all you know classical physics, classical mathematics. When we, we when we when when you brought up uh, and I'm sorry, your listener, your name was Anne. Anne, uh, when you brought up the issue of the stability problem, mm -hmm. we feel we're treading in an area that maybe we don't have the experience on staff. Whether we don't know, we've actually even employed some chaos theory experts to help us understand. We know what the results are inside the field. We know what we're modulating on the outside. We just do not have the mathematical model as to, that shows why the field goes unstable. Thank the you. mathematical model isn't that difficult, and you can probably derive it from uh, uh, duality theory of manifolds. Uh, it's, 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 Caller, do you think you could get, uh, contact him privately? Sure. Uh, it sounds like it's a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> hey, I'm falling in love here. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Take, thank you so much. Take care. Mm -hmm. Holy mackerel. I like that. I like that call. I wasn't ready for that one at all. All right. Um, wild card line. You're on the air with Dr. Uh, David Anderson. Hello. Hello, Art. Dr. Anderson. Yes, hi. Hi, this is the Zen Man calling from Anchorage, Alaska. Okay. I had a comment about the uh, definition of time okay. or uh, what time is. For years now, I've been meditating, and I've noticed repeatedly this phenomenon for about the past 20 years. I'll call it frozen time. It's when a uh, clock, if you keep a clock just outside of the uh, your vision, um, doesn't matter what kind of clock, mechanical or digital, uh -huh. uh, I've noticed repeatedly that the uh, second hand will freeze. Now, the moment, the very moment that you become aware of this, of course, it starts moving again. <laughs> now, I, I've noticed um, doing this meditative practice called Qigong, oh. that, uh, which is a control of the uh, heart rate, which might be considered the basic organic measurement of time. Yogas do that, yes. <laughs> okay. Um that uh, I might be approximating some level of satori, which might be considered to be the uh, timeless state where the individual is in indirect contact with the collective unconscious. And I wondered if, if Dr. Anderson had any comments. Well, uh, yeah, and we're moving into the meta metaphysical a little bit, but it is a kind of an interesting question in view of the setup he did on, on the nature of time as well. Right, it's a, it's a non-mechanical-based time effect. And I think it would kind of play into the uh, theory here a little bit. Well, well I tell you, my, my first reaction is, is for listeners, and, and it's surprising to hear me say this because I wouldn't have said this six years ago. Um, I, I believe that eventually uh, the ability to, to, to travel or transcend time, if you want to put it that way, will not only come from a, a technological solution, but also from uh, probably from within the power of the human mind. And, and, and what, what, what uh, your, your listener is saying here uh, is very consistent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Buddhist uh, Buddhist monks will tell you that that they they don't understand why why we think that time moves when in fact it stays where it is. And, and in in that philosophy, I don't mean to bring in karma, and I'm not an expert here, but the, the thought is when a person transcends karma and can 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 achieve that pure state, that uh, uh, that time, um, past, present, and future all becomes one, and they can see and transcend all time as being stationary and standing still. Caller, I think he's agreeing with you. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much. And, uh, and take care. Sorry, Art, that was a little bit of a long-winded response. No, 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 <laughs> that, that was just fine. Uh, I, I thought he was going in a wrong direction, and then it all came together for me there. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. David Anderson. Hi. Hey, hi, Stephen. Uh, hi, uh, I can barely hear you. Um, yes, sir? Uh, how are you doing, Stephen? Your name is Stephen? Uh, David. David. In uh, South Carolina. Okay. Uh, I was wondering within the parameters of uh, the device where you're finding trouble on the uh, low end of digression, uh, have y'all tried any pulse 
uh, alternative to try to stabilize. And uh, I'm wondering if uh, within the uh, uh, usage of the device at some point in the future, uh, would it be, uh, I mean, maybe this is theoretical, I don't know, but would it be uh, any type of a device being able to put it one location and one or the other to use it as transportation? Oh, okay, well, that, and that's, that's enough. Let's hold it right there. A pulse to stabilize, does that make any sense? Yeah, actually, uh, actually, we do that today. When, when I talk about modulating the field with our with, with our laser array, we we do have a pulse configuration employed today. All right. Uh, we're still experiencing many problems with stability when we retard or slow down the time rate. All right. What about uh, transportation from one physical location to another, not just through time, but through space, obviously as well. Well, w what's interesting is, um, and, and people are surprised by this comment, uh, the approach of our technology today as we understand it does not allow that. And, and, and many people, that puts a contradiction in their mind. But, uh, but uh, Well, a lot of people say, here, here's something a lot of people say. They say, look, the Earth uh, moves in an orbit around the sun. And the Earth rotates, right? Yes. So if you move somebody in time... Uh, have they not moved in space and, in fact, uh, 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 the globe has turned while this has occurred? So wouldn't there be di a physical displacement? Yeah. Actually, the, the classical, the classical uh, time machine from H.G. Wells' uh, movie, The Time Machine, uh, uh, fails for that reason. Because if you did have an object that was stationary and moved through time, when you returned, the Earth would no longer be there. Yes. Um, there you'd be in the vacuum of space. Yeah, and, and many people apply that model to what we're doing. Understand what we're doing is is um, um, is 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 completely different. What we have is is a contained field, and we're adjusting time rates inside. We're not requiring movement through space to accomplish the time dilation, or we're not claiming to have a a, a uh, uh, the classical Wellsian time machine, if you say. Um, but essentially because we have a field and the time rate divergence is created inside of the field, um, wherever that field moves, that object is still inside that field. It, it is still there. Very comforting. I mean, you yeah. just wouldn't want to pop out in a complete vacuum uh, with enough time and breath to say, damn, and that'd be it. Exactly. Uh, all right. Uh, West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. David Anderson. Hello. Hey, Dr. Anderson. How are you doing? I'm doing fine tonight. How about yourself? Thank oh, you. Oh, not bad. Um, yeah, I wonder if you could explain to me, um, um, physics just, uh, fascinates me and, and this, uh, program is pretty interesting. I just wanted to know if, uh, how you could explain <clears throat> how, uh, time 2,000 years ago is, is like, uh, the time present today. Um, or did I misunderstand that? Uh, I'm not sure of what you just said. <clears throat> Okay, um, he said that, that the explanation for time, that there was no explanation for time as far as uh, um, some parts of physics. Yes. Um, could you explain that to me? Well, if he could, he would have answered the question when I asked him. Oh. The, the answer is, I think, that he cannot uh, adequately explain that, and I don't really know anybody who can. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, it, it fascinates because I mean it goes on. The day goes, the day goes, you know, and yes. and so time must be happening as far as uh, the sun rises and it goes down in the in the, in the west. Uh, yeah, know? very good. That that's exactly how we measure how we measure time, right, yeah. Doctor? Yes, that, that's a good question. But I, I guess I would challenge your listener to to put him to the test. Okay, so we all know what time is. We see it every day, so um, we understand it. So what is it? Mm -hmm. What it, is time itself? It's uh, got to be a, a, just a, a day-to-day -day thing. And, uh, <laughs> well, but, yeah, but that's insufficient. It is day-to-day. -day. Yes, the sun, uh, we go round, uh, we go round, the sun comes up, sun goes down, and we measure. Mm -hmm. But is that the totality of time, or is that just sort of our understanding of it as we physically tool around on the planet here? Well, well, thank you very much for uh, enlightening me on that. Uh. <laughs> I'm not sure there was a lot of enlightenment there, but at least we've got the questions right. Thank I'm just you. a little confused, and, and I'm no, still all kind of this, confused. We're all confused. Don't worry that's about it. It's a pretty interesting uh, subject, and I'm all ears. <laughs> all right, uh, indeed. Doctor, hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour. We'll be right back. All right, back into the abyss we jump. Uh, Dr. David Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson, here's a kind of an interesting speculative sort of question, but talk about a breakthrough. 
Mark from Canton, Ohio asks, uh, Doctor, could you eventually, uh, as you refine your process, send future research data back in time uh, in order to accelerate your own progress? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the answer to that question is today. Today, um, understand what we do is we can speed up or slow down the time rate in the field. We have not been able to reverse time in the field. So someday if that was possible, maybe yes. Today, we're, we're not sure and we're a little bit skeptical whether the technology will actually, this particular technology applied will allow a negative time, uh, allow, allow, um, um, allow a negative time rate to would that, would, the information to the past. Would that answer the paradox question? You know, the uh, go back in time and, and kill your grandfather or your father or something or another and poof, away you go. In other words, the paradox uh, is in fact um, a hard rule and, and you can't do that because you can't travel back in time. I don't believe that. I, I really I really don't believe um, that paradox. And, and the reason why I would say that, uh, many of your listeners might be familiar with uh, what's called the Tipler cylinder. Frank Tipler, back in 1974, published a paper that showed how reverse time travel to the past is possible um, uh, in, in, in using a certain approach. Now, it, granted, it was very extravagant. It was a large rotating cylinder in space uh, involving a spaceship with tremendous technical performance, but it allowed physically, it was the first proof that showed time travel to the past was possible. So is it possible within the laws of physics to travel in a negative time direction? Absolutely yes. So I think someday that will be achieved and the, the issue of the grandfather paradox might fall away um, as being only really just again one of those places where our rational mind bumps into its own limitation. Uh, but are you able to help me out at all with that? In other words, if you could travel back, why, what would prevent you from causing all this time havoc? Actually, actually, technically, technically, nothing. Technically, nothing would create you from having that time, time creating So, in other words, as you, as you can take well, a revolver and put it to your head and blow yourself away and cease to exist in all practical the, ways. The only, the only, the only, uh, first off, if, if it's it's through relativistic physics, a travel in a negative time. If we accomplish that using relativistic physics, then there's no reason why you couldn't travel to the past and, and alter the past. Now there is some speculation that says, well, if you do travel to the past, uh, you'll end up in a parallel universe, in, in, in a, a version of reality that's separate from the other parallel universe that's running on where you didn't go back. Ah, so, so you won't disturb the timeline, the main timeline. Yeah, that in fact you're affecting now a parallel timeline uh, that is branched off in a different direction. So that's one explanation of, of a possible gotcha. answer. Of... Gotcha, for the paradox. Did you see the movie Frequency? You know, no, I have not. What? You haven't seen Frequency? <laughs> You've got to see that movie right away. You must go rent that movie right away. You yeah. know, I'm sure I have it on on our shelves in our in, in our, our our space time museum, but I don't think that I've I, I have not seen it. No, trust I me, trust me. See the movie. Uh, the, the question is as follows: uh, Perhaps before we're able to actually physically travel in time, and this comes from the movie in a way, would you imagine it to be possible to communicate through time? I believe, I, I, yes, I do. I, I do. I believe that um, across long distances of time, um, if, I, if I can say it that way, yes, that, that communication, uh, especially communication to the past, would be achieved prior to actually sending uh, mass to the past, meaning, you know, a person, a ship, or something like that. Yes, 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 uh, because of the, uh, the problems inherent in biological transfers. Exactly. All right. Um, first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Anderson. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, okay, sir. Where are you? Uh, greetings from Chicagoland. From Chicago. Yeah. Uh, I had a question for Dr. Anderson. And by the way, I've, I've, only, I've only been listening for about a week now. So it's great to hear something out there that actually is along the same lines that I think about, Art. Um, Dr. Anderson, on, on the... Um, Actual field that you said you, that that uh, you generate that it's a circular field. Have you had any experiments when you put something in it, say that that goes into field and out of the field at the same time? It, ah, it, something extending uh, right through the field. Exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And say like a solid object, does the field stay? Does it just affect one part of the object, or does it actually 
encompass the entire part of the object? Good question. Okay. Um, the, the answer is is that it does not it does not engulf the entire object. Um, but moving things through a field is something that we learned that we don't do. First off, if it's a living organism moving through the field, you're passing it through the boundary layer where where all that time differential is being absorbed, including that Doppler effect, which means we pass a living organism through the boundary layer of the field once it's set up, then uh, that, living, that living organism is going to be destroyed, uh, guaranteed. Um, with regards to material objects, I mean non-living uh, uh, material objects, uh, we have put objects in the field. Uh, we get some strange effects, but nothing that would would you know engulf that entire object in the field. It, it pretty much uh, um, has no effect. I see. We have uh, we have measured. We have run signals back and forth in and out of the field, both optical um, and uh, through conductors in and out of the field, and the results we see are very very predictable. I see. I I wondered because the uh, um, the call. Caller earlier had asked about uh, traveling kind of through time, through time, and uh, this this goes towards a warp, like a like a warp drive, if you will. If you have something that that can actually encompass that that field where you get some particle off of it, it actually could go through time, kind of as a warp drive almost. That's why I was wondering that. Yeah. Yeah, we call it a time warp field because we slightly twist time. I mean, maybe we, right. should, we probably shouldn't have used the word warp in hindsight, but uh, that was 13 years ago that we put the label on it, and now it's stuck. So <laughs> I understand. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Dr. David Anderson. Hi. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Uh, hi, Art. Hi, Anderson there. Um, I was just wondering um, if you've tried this. I, I know you, you said you're having problem with, I guess, with the Doppler effect there. Is that that's basically a harmonic problem you're having? Is that with the stability of, of the lasers? Basically, is what what you're having a problem with? Uh, well, what happens is, you know, the, the the boundary layer of the field always has a Doppler effect, but when we slow the time rate, the the thickness of the boundary layer expands into the core of the field. So typically, the the Doppler effect is constricted to the outer shell of the field. When we retard the time rate or slow down the time rate, and the core, and the, and that boundary layer becomes thicker, it collapses into the core, and basically anything inside the field, most of it can be exposed to the Doppler. Typically, we like to keep it on the outside, where it's where it's away from the samples or or instrumentation inside the core. I see. Um, are you familiar with how our CRT a cathode ray tube works? The color with the um, there's there's it's under a vacuum, and you have three electron guns shooting sure. through. Um, well, have you ever simulated or tried doing this maybe in a vacuum or probably in a zero gravity effect? Hmm. Uh, no, we have not, we have not done it, we have not done it in a vacuum and, uh, no, we have not, we have not speculated about doing it in a zero gravity effect mainly because it's, it's, it's not practical due to the size of the, the equipment and the, uh, the, the power required. Uh, one other thing is, do you, do you, do you create a large enough field to actually put a video camera camcorder that, and, and reproduce and, the field and then play it back and see what it sees. <laughs> yes, we we actually actually in in the the current one that we've done we've put target objects in with a small digital digital recorder uh, and we've pulled them out. We we had some problems in certain areas because of the interference with the camera, but it showed that the object is there in the field even though the boundary layer of the field is opaque. When that field goes opaque, is it really there? Is the camera and the object really there? Or is the camera and the object really somewhere else? Uh, uh, I guess I can't answer that. Have you, you well then you've taken an operating say video camera uh to the point where it begins to disappear? No, well when when the camera is inside we we put a, a very small digital camera and recorder inside the field with an object a target object in front of the lens uh, and we showed that as we as we retarded the field uh or accelerated the field and and we saw the opaqueness from the outside is that yes. the, the video was pretty much undisturbed except for some interference, um, minor interference. So the oh, the question was, that was that camera still seeing the object inside the field when yeah. we started the field? The answer was yes. So they're still there somewhere. Um, <laughs> so what would you, what did you, when you, uh, prior to doing that experiment, what did you expect to see? Exactly that. Um, this is really a... Um, all, all the results we've seen are like a general relativistic effect, um, and, and I don't mean to throw it out that way. Pretty much, what we what we see is very predictable. The only thing that's not predictable is what happens in that thin boundary layer. Gotcha. We still don't understand why everything happens there. All right, the way it does. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. David Anderson. Hello. Yeah. Good morning. 
Good morning. Um, I have done a lot of research on the Internet, and um, I think I may have an understanding of how gravity works, and I wonder if this may have some uh, relation uh, to an understanding of time. Um, my understanding basically assumes that the fabric of space and time, the ether, does exist, and that the force of this ether or zero-point energy is stretching the fabric of space and time equally in all directions, um, except when it is in the presence of matter. Uh, this is so because matter attracts the zero-point energy in towards itself, sustaining itself, and in this manner, the fabric of space and time is significantly distorted around a massive object. In a massive body system like the Earth and Moon, there's less zero-point energy pressure in between them. Basically, I believe that gravity is a large-scale Casimir effect. Um, if this is so, Dr. Anderson, I would like to know what you think about this explanation of gravity and if you think that this flow rate of time or that the flow rate of time could be related to um, zero-point energy. Okay. Um, there's probably three responses in there. The first one... Uh, does th does a mass in space dis distort space and time? Absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, that's I, I accept that. That's uh, that would be part of of, of classical physics. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, does uh, the second half of that, with regards to zero point energy? I mean, obviously, I'm I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with some of it, but uh, but I am not I'm not an expert on uh, Nikolai Tesla's work in that area or other people's work in that area. It's even sad because I'm sitting here on Long Island where many of Tesla's facilities were, um, but I'm not familiar with that. Um, th there are many many simil similarities between um, with re with regard with regards to the the, the 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 mass distorting space and time around a mass in space. Absolutely, yes, I agree with the other ones. I'm probably not qualified to answer. Well, if you could look at a single atom inside your field, um, what would you um, see? How would you how would you say that the field actually affects this atom? Um, is it at the stage of the um, parts of the atom, the the um, I guess the sub uh, particle parts, the, the gluons, muons, and um, and so forth, or would it be on the electron? Or I mean, it's got to affect it in some way. I agree. Yes. Well, uh, actually, um, actually, it's, you know, it, it's a good question. But remember, we're talking about, and, and you mentioned gravity. And when I talk about general, a general relativistic effect, this is a whole theory about how gravity uh, can affect and dilate time. Um, if, if, when you have a field like this. Or let's take the simple example of the high-speed rocket ship where you have somebody traveling out into space, coming back 10 years, and the Earth has, has passed uh, a, a thousand years. Right. That individual and his biochemical structure and his perception of time and his life and his body and his living organism have not experienced anything different. Um, his, his, his atoms have not been altered. His, his electrons, his subatomic structure is still the same. Uh, his... his uh, his evolution of himself as a living organism has not changed any differently than if he was on the Earth for ten years, assuming that all the you know the gravitational issues and all that that are the same. Um, so the answer is no. I, I don't. I, we don't expect, uh, nor do we see um, or expect any any changes in, in in structure, cellular structure, or atomic structure. In the boundary layers, it's a totally different story. All bets are off there. The yeah, art. Yes, can, I, can I throw in a philosophical comment here? Yes. I think it's appropriate. In thinking about the idea of parallel universes and time travel and a lot of the other stuff you've seen your, on your show, it makes me wonder if we and all of the created universe is nothing but a complicated and intricate computer program slash hologram that exists inside <laughs> the mind of God. Oh, let's just use the word matrix and everything. Matrix. Will know. Yeah. All right. I like that word. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe we'll all find out shockingly one day. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. David Anderson. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, um, I have uh, several questions. I don't know if I'll have, I don't know if you'll um, let me ask all of them. Well, but, I don't know uh, if I will either, but go ahead and try. But um, anyway, um, I, am, I am a kid who um, listens to your show all the time. Um, How old are you? I'm 13. All right, first question is why are you up at this hour? <laughs> because uh, I've been wanting to um, talk about the about the uh, moon uh, about the moon thing, and but since that subject's over, no, it's not. Uh, we're going to do a final hour of open lines. We'll talk about that and time travel. Okay. Uh, so, but you have a question for Dr. Anderson? Yeah, um, I am a long uh, time fan of time travel, and uh, now that I hear that it's science fiction is actually coming true, uh, I was just wondering if, when will this be out to the public? Okay. Well, actually, um, we, we, we released some information um, uh, uh, to the public. Like I mentioned, there's been several uh, different publications. Let me throw a few out. You, if, if you check the Wall Street Journal, 
Um, Fox, also Fox Television, uh, is going to be bringing back a, a show called In Search Of. Uh, and they're actually going to be showing some glimpses inside and outside of our laboratory and, and some information about our work that will be airing next month. Um, our, our public release, uh, also under Freedom of Information, uh, you can find some early work prior to 1988. Uh, and within the next two months, uh, we're going to be releasing and making public a, um, uh, a new research paper that talks about some of the power problems we've been having with the with the field, but it's going to give a complete overview of of the current status of the time warp field technology and our understanding of it. So, so the answer to your question, caller, is some of the information is out there if you know where to look, and he just told you. Um, I th listen, caller. Thank you. You're right. We don't have a lot of time, but I I want to ask this, doctor. How much do you know? that you can't tell me uh, proprietary information how how much information is there that you can't discuss on the radio well um uh, there's certain things uh um obviously we we have clients who 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 um um who 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 fund some of our research and we do research for them and we have confidentiality agreements that's straightforward i assume more you you'd be be talking about what aspects of the technology and performance uh uh, we can't talk about. Um, uh, no, uh, no, because that would you, you couldn't answer that. Uh, yeah. Are there aspects of it that you can't talk about? Uh, I'd say it this way: the answer to that question is yes. There are aspects that I cannot talk about, and obviously, any time you have um, uh, research of this nature, um, what is what is what is released publicly is typically a generation behind uh, what is really going on. Oh, oh really? Yes. Um, well, that says a whole lot. Gee, we can all wonder where the next generation uh, is that's going on right now. Oh, my, 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 my. Well, all you right. know, uh, it just, this is going to be a fascinating two years. I mean, when you look at what's going on, and, 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 I, and I won't even, uh, that's not even, you know, if you want to talk about the Time Travel Research Center at all, my, one of my biggest passions is people really need to take a look at what's going on with our understanding of time. I mean, it is being turned upside down within, within the last two years. There have been at least four or five significant events that have totally, you know, validated new views of time. But sometimes we just race through life and we don't see these things. That's right. Well, uh, l let me plug it for you again. There's a new videotape, Time Travel, Journeys into Time. It eventually will be in your video store, but if you can't wait, and I know I can't, you can go to uh, uh, the doctor's website, which is uh, uh, linked right now on my website. And you can actually order the tape right there. How much is the tape, by the way? Uh, the tape is $39. $39. That's not much money for a good uh, grasp of an understanding of time and a glimpse into the lab where you're working. And you do get a glimpse in? Absolutely. Get a glimpse in a summary of our technology, uh, an overview of our performance, our, our system configuration, uh, uh, and many other details, too. It's a complete exploration into the nature of time and time travel from... Uh, um, uh, from 20,000 years ago to uh, uh, the latest groundbreaking technology. Doctor, I hope you can get a little sleep before your flight. Boy, has this been a good program. Thank you, Art. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Good night. Good night. <sighs> Time travel. And I'll tell you. Anyway, listen, we're going to do open lines when we come back and... Uh, that young fellow who I had to cut off is welcome to call back and talk about whether or not we went to the moon or time travel or whatever else is on anybody's mind out there. Open lines when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell.